Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, Batten down the hatches. It's another episode of the Jeff Gerstman Show. I'll be your host for this week's installment of the program. My name is Jeff Gerstman. Thanks for having me. Uh, and this week, we're going to be talking about the wonderful world of video games. They've come a long way since the bleeps and bloops of Pac-Man. And they're not just for kids anymore. There's a wide array of hardcore pornographic video games that are not for the kiddos. Let's investigate. 1983's Stroker. Was it? No. Um, it's a great game. <laughs> It's a great game. Stroker's a great game. You should check it out. Don't, 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 don't check it. Don't, don't check it out. We're going to recreate the majesty and the pageantry of Stroker for the Commodore 64 within the confines of Roblox. That's what they're allowing that now, right? Is that the, is that the whole thing? For, is that the, that's the, the, the Roblox update? Is, uh... They're just allowing, uh, they're just like blowing the doors off. They're like, hey man, do what you do, I guess. You're going to do it anyway. We're just tired of enforcing it. So here, here, here you go. Um, gosh, what's going on? Hey, it's been uh, an interesting week since we last spoke. Um, this week we'll see the release of AEW Fight Forever. Um, I recorded... A conversation with Glenn Rubenstein, co-host of Game Boys to Men. Uh, he and I have both been playing the game for a little bit here, um, and we just I, we ended up. It's a two-hour video of us talking about wrestling, and then somewhere in the middle there, we talk about the game. It's, the, it's uh, you know, that's a very uh, confined, uh, very well composed conversation. But yeah, that'll that'll go up tomorrow. Um, Along with some some other stuff, and then and then tomorrow, I believe we'll we'll stream the game. We'll take a look at it, and uh, we'll have a conversation about AEW Fight Forever. Uh, but there's been a lot of other stuff going on. I decided, um, I needed to know. Sometimes, um, in 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 my, in this li in this line of work. There are things where I just decide I need to see it for myself. I have to find out. I have to um, figure out what this is all about and if it matters or not. And so, um, you know, a week or two after release, I suppose it is. It came out earlier this month. I went ahead and picked up the uh, ROG, the Asus ROG Ally. The, the Republic of Gamers uh ally which is their steam deck esque device it is a handheld you know hey it's it's what it looks like it's a handheld computer uh the difference between this one and the steam deck i mean if you really want to top level it is that this one is running windows out of the box and so um you know some of the things you may have heard about the steam deck and its limitations around like oh you can't play call of duty because it's got anti cheat that doesn't work on linux and destiny 2 and and some of those other games that uh you you cannot uh run out of the box on a steam deck without going in in some cases going and installing windows uh onto a steam deck which hmm, um this just does that out of the box well out of the box, this thing. So, okay. I went ahead and bought this. I, th I don't know if Best Buy is the only place that is selling these, if that's the how they're doing it or what the deal is, but that's the only place I've seen them. So I went ahead and ordered one last week and I have been messing with it for a handful of days. Um, I th think I... I I really dislike a lot of things about the Asus ROG Ally. It's 700 bucks, uh, which is not uh, completely out of line with the, you know, the Steam Deck and, you know, some of the, the pricing there. And I've been using the Steam Deck pretty regularly for, you know, gosh, on and off for coming up on a year or something, I guess. I, I've been, I've been using it for 
for a while. This is a more powerful device. The parts in it, it has a 1080p screen that can run at 120 hertz. Uh, it has, um, I, you know, you can go look at the specs and all that sort of stuff. But the, the theory is that it's got a more powerful graphics part in it. Uh, and it also has a higher resolution screen. And it is a very nice screen. Um, and, and it runs windows, which then, you know, parlays into, Hey, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can pretty much run anything you can run on a PC. Well, in theory run on this in, in some way, shape or form. This is the most disjointed experience out of the box that I have had in a good long time. And part of that comes from like, yo, it's running windows. Which, uh, I like Windows. I'm not some weird OS snob. I, I, I've been running... I, I really like Windows 11. I think it is a solid improvement over Windows 10. Um, without breaking the things you like about Windows 10. And, um, and so I've been running Windows 11 basically since the, the, the first moment I could run Windows 11. I've been running Windows 11. Um, this has... A real lack of cohesion when it comes to launchers and different storefronts and all of the kind of other bits and pieces of it. Um, whereas the Steam Deck, out of the box, you turn it on, it boots up to Steam. And it's right there, and and you can get to the Linux desktop and 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 do some stuff with it, and and uh, you know, you 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 can get kind of down to the bare metal or whatever if you so desire. But like when you turn it on, the games are presented right in front of you. This thing instead runs something that uh, Asus has come up with, like a few different programs that Asus has come up with. Uh, both for updates and for managing controller configurations. and It's a launcher. They have a thing called Armory Crate that by default launches and launches full screen. And it is designed to be a cross-platform launcher. You can use it to install Steam and the Epic Game Store and whatever else. Um, at, at the Battle.net, for whatever reason, is not on the list. And Armory Crate, I think you can install it on a desktop PC if you so desire. It's dog shit. It's fucking terrible. It's absolute trash. It is the worst thing. But also, Armory Crate is how you configure your controls on this thing. You'll notice, unlike the Steam Deck, it doesn't have trackpads or any kind of mouse equivalent. And so instead, what they do is they have you hit one of this button here and toggle between a two different control modes. One is desktop and one is gaming. When it's gaming, this whole thing is treated like a controller, as you might expect. When it's desktop, you can use the analog sticks to move the mouse around, which is a terrible experience. It has a touch screen. Use the touch screen. It's a much better way to, to navigate things. Um, but still, the touch pads would be a welcome, you know, like I, I miss the touch pads. I don't even play games that necessarily require the touch pads on the Steam Deck. But when you need them, you need them. And they're very handy for that. And so Armory Crate also manages configurations for the back buttons. There are two back buttons. Uh, the Steam Deck has four, for whatever that's worth. Um, I don't like the feel of these back buttons one bit. Um, and so then there are a series of chords you can play to, like, if you hit the back button, and I believe up, that will pull up the on-screen keyboard, the Windows on-screen keyboard. Uh, if you push left, I think that'll show desktop. Right will alt-tab through your open windows. And I believe down will bring up the task manager? Anyway, there, there are basically a handful of things. that, And so if you don't have Armory Crate open, none of that works. None of the cording, none of the shortcuts work. And so it's this disastrous thing where unless you want to go seek out third-party software that replicates some of that functionality, which I think people are trying to build, um, you're stuck running this shit factory of an app. I hate it. It is abysmal. Um, 
Now, the, the device also, so it has two kind of uh, menu-y sort of buttons here that are neither of which are an Xbox button. So you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to run Steam Big Picture and you want to be able to pull up the interface in-game and to do that, you hit the guide button, whatever you have mapped it to and, and, and whatever else. And so there's no dedicated button for that here on their kind of controller surface. And so then that creates a situation where like, okay, now I have to go into Armory Crate and configure the gaming mode controls. So when I'm in gaming mode, this back button is actually the Xbox button. Uh, that's not a great experience. Um, and also, I don't know if you've, uh, this is something I've run into on regular Windows from time to time. That sometimes you get in a situation where, and it's, it's kind of one of the OS level things that I hate and immediately turn off. It's the Xbox Game Bar, and Microsoft has made this, and it's, it's designed to where if you hit that Xbox button, it'll pull up this Windows, you know, it'll pull up their overlay so that you can look at your friends list and some other trash like that. You have to disable it. It's, it's useless. Um, it, it, chances are, if you're using a gaming thing, um, I, 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 if I want the guide button to do anything in any app, it's going to be in Steam. And I'm going to want to have it be exclusively used in Steam. It took me, and this is mostly from like, I haven't had to deal with this for a while. So I forgot the steps you have to go through to make it work. But I had to go through and go like, okay, um, I need to disable the game bar. Uh, I need to make sure it's turned on in Steam to where hitting the guide button focuses Steam. When I push the button, I need, and that stuff was, was, a bit of a hassle, a bit of a slog to get through. Um, eventually I realized there's another setting in windows that lets you turn off the guide button brings up game bar functionality. And it's not the, the things in game bar, are not actually the thing you need to disable. There's another setting somewhere else. Um, so I had to jump through all of those hoops to, to get all of that done. Um, they should have, you know, they know what they're making. They're trying to make a gaming device. They should have put a proper guide button on it. Third-party controllers come with these fucking guide buttons on them now all day long. Um, and so it's a, it's a really strange omission. <laughs> Nicolini asks, how long does it take to actually just play a game? Okay, well, look. I also had to spend hours... Updating firmware, updating the BIOS, updating software applications, and then also running Windows Update on top of that stuff. Um, in addition to the Armory Crate, which has, there's a setting in there for search for updates. And that pulled in updates for like some kind of app core and audio driver and some other stuff that Windows Update, I think, would have pulled in. So I think, I don't know if it's just like a big overlay for the Windows update experience that they tried to make or whatever, but like I had to hit that a few different times and reboot a few different times just to get the updates installed. And then there is a separate piece of garbage bloatware that they install called My Asus. And inside that application, which I had to create an account in order to get into, and all of these applications are like all covered in like click here for Chinese. There's like the, the, the apps, the, the, the apps themselves are fucking garbage. I had to load up my Asus because it was popping a notification saying there's an update ready. All of these apps look like fucking malware. Get into my Asus and find that there are two more updates there. One seems to be a BIOS update and one is an updater to the BIOS updater which seems like you don't want to install those in the wrong order or, or whatever. So I had to install some updates there. Now the catch on that also is to install most of these updates, you have to be using, I believe a 65 watt power adapter. So it only works with the power adapter. As far as I can tell, the adapter that comes with it does that. I tried using a Nintendo switch up uh, uh, charger, which I had been using successfully with steam deck for months. Um, this wouldn't, it wouldn't, the updates don't install until you plug it into the real actual charger. Um, and so that, and there's no, there was no menu that says 
it, all it says is plug this into power. And I'm like looking at it going, motherfucker, this is as plugged into power as it can be. And I'm like, oh, wait, no, you need it to be plugged into more power. But the menu, the, 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 the screen doesn't say anything about that. So once I plugged it into the charger that came with it, um, it immediately started updating. That's a, you know, it's a, your mileage may vary, right? I'm obviously the switch charger is not going to deliver as much juice as a dedicated other thing because the switch doesn't need it. So it's, it's absolutely understandable. But just, you know, all USB-C cables, all of that other stuff. So, jump through all those hoops. Start install installing games. Um, install the Battle.net client so I can get Diablo installed. I got another, I bought yet another SD card. It feels like once or twice a year. I'm like, well, I need another one terabyte SD card. It has a micro SD port right here. And, um... Every so often, the SD card would just vanish from Windows. I was like, oh, where's my D drive? D drive's just gone. What the fuck's going on? What, what, what happened? Why did, uh, where did, where did my SD card go to? And I go up and kind of feel the slot a little bit. The SD card continually wriggles out of the slot. Right now it's seated in there pretty well, but sometimes I run my finger over it and it's like, oh, this is like somehow popped up and I need to take my fingernail and go fucking get back in there. And then it goes, hey man, D drives back. Let's go. This has happened. And I, again, I started this, I started with this on Friday and I've been messing with it and, and I've been busy with the kids all weekend. So I, you know, I've, I've had time to mess with it but not the limited time I've had to mess with it I have had to jam that SD card back in there five or six times I have seen pictures on the internet of people stuffing pieces of paper in there to keep that fucking SD card in now eventually this SD card is going to pop out while it's writing and it's going to get corrupted let's just I just look at it and go like well I guess that's just going to fucking happen huh um I suspect that why it's doing that is so you'll see if you're if you're watching the video version, if not, I'll explain it. The SD slot is on the top of the device and right next to it is one of the vents. There are two vents on the top that vent heat. This fucking thing and, and I, I have uh, in my uh, struggles here, I've been reading other people's takes on this device and, and seen a lot of people say, Oh, it doesn't get hot at all. It's like, well, are you just not touching it? Are you just not touching it up here? Where? Because the whole top of this thing gets scorching, blazing, fucking hot. Um, you know, there's some hot ass air coming out of this thing. I set it on the bed, and you know, the the, the vents were not blocked, but they were shooting at my pillow, which was far enough away, not a dangerous situation. But I was like, oh, I'm gonna play it in bed later, and I'm gonna copy some stuff over while it happens. I went over there and touched the pillow. I was like, shit, this is going to start a fire. What the fuck? What the fuck is going on? Um, and so I, and, and this SD card slot gets extremely hot also. Um, and so my theory is that because this whole thing heats up, everything jiggle, they have expands, something happens, and then the SD card slides out of the slot. It's insane. Absolutely insane. That that's a thing. <laughs> um, now, you know, hey, listen, I, in, in all fairness, like I, I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily, I'm, I'm trying, not trying to constantly compare this to the Steam Deck, but I will say in some fairness that, you know, I did not have a Steam Deck right at launch, but reading over like from people who did, the Steam Deck had some fucking issues at launch from a software perspective, from a firmware perspective. And, you know, some people had to return some units like, hey, it's, it's still relatively new hardware. This thing's still in the window. Of, of being relatively new hardware, but damn. Um, I, I think that the buttons on the face feel cheap. I think the D-pad feels really crappy. Um, you know, there's, there's just, it's, it's like, it's a bunch of little stuff. It's a bunch of stuff that you look at it and go like, man, yeah, they, there's, there's some things that they could do that would really make this device sing. But the pros of like the 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 benefits of running Windows 11 directly on the device, I think, are really undercut by how piss poor the user experience is on the device. 
because Windows 11 is not built for this type of unit yet. And there's tons of things that they could do to make it friendly. I mean, obviously, like Windows for the last couple versions now has been heading down this road of trying to be better about touch screens and, and you know, uh, different types of devices. Like they, they've definitely din, done a lot of work that wasn't there back in the Windows 7 days or, or whatever it was. So in some ways it's, you know, it's, it's, it's better than you might think considering how windows can be, uh, or used to be, I suppose. Um, but the, I think the user experience is, is a real mess across the board, you know, and it's the sort of situation where it just, it doesn't even the, the, you don't see it as this like unified experience, this unified device of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to smoothly click this button and then this game's going to launch and then I'm going to go off into the game and then I'm going to hit this button that's right here and then I'm going to bring up the interface to close the game and um, and and do all of those things. It it Instead, it feels like I'm going to click this button and then it's going to show me the Windows desktop for a little bit and then this is going to pop up and okay, oh, okay, now it's launching and, you know, it, it's for better or worse, it's doing the things a PC does. And that's fine. It just doesn't look good from a, like, look at this handheld game device sort of unit. It, it, I've run into a situation now, I don't know what the fuck happened, where now the taskbar, which is, is set to automatically hide uh, when you ter first turn it on, they did some configuring, you know, of the install uh, by the time you get your hands on it. That has stopped happening. So now I launch games and the taskbar is over it at the bottom of the screen. And I have to like physically, you know, I have to tap on the screen to move the game into the foreground. And that will then hide the, the taskbar. I didn't change anything on the settings side. Um, it was working just fine. And now it doesn't. So I don't know. That's, you know, some of that is going to be just Windows stuff, right? I mean, you know, Windows can... And, and I don't mind it on a desktop one bit because um, I, I don't do most of that stuff on, on a desktop because you don't need to. But I think in terms of like trying to present this as like a, a, a friendly gaming device that you're going to get and fire up and be like, let's play some games. I think that it sucks for that. I think it's really, they have, they have a long way to go on the interface and user experience and everything else to make that a reality. Like I, I was kind of taken aback by like, just like, man, Armory Crate is Fucking terrible. Yes, Phil Bosch is exactly. Right. Imagine a kid getting one of these. And kids are smart, so you know, whatever, they'll figure it out. But imagine someone getting one of these that has never used a computer. Uh, this is a computer. That's cool. Uh, but it's like here's this Windows 11 machine with none of the accoutrements you need to properly use a Windows 11 machine, like a mouse and a fucking keyboard, <laughs> you know, and, and hey, we've got these clunky shortcuts that sometimes don't work that'll let you pull up the keyboard uh, that'll let you do this and that. And it's just not ready. This is a this is not a prime. This does not feel like a prime time device in any way, shape, or form, between the hardware issues of the SD card popping out the top um, to the, the Armory Crate software being just absolute trash, but somehow necessary because you need it to have access to these buttons. And then there's the battery life. So that... <sighs> hmm. By default, this thing has little LED-colored rings on it that light up. And you can have, you have some control over how the lighting color is. And, and, you know, it has RGB shit on it for, for real gamers. Um, meanwhile, I played one match of Halo Infinite on this device and it took 30% of the battery to do so. People are reporting numbers in the two hour range for battery. Um, and again, for comparison's sake, I will say that the Steam Deck is, you know, another situation of like, hey man, there's some battery life stuff here that sure we sure wish was better um but the end result there has it has led to the hobbyist community of people that own these things coming up with um their own applications that will try to starve games for wattage and, and you know there's a lot of like people going in and going 
well, I can get, if I lower it to 15 watts while this game is running, you can still get 60 frames per second and you can still do this. And then it's a level of tinkering that I am not here for. Um, the, the wattage starving, uh, uh, like, like that is a little, that is maybe a bridge too far for me. Um, I like going in on the steam deck and figuring out weird ways to make battle net and Epic games run under Linux. I think that's a fun type of tinkering. Um, I think that that's that, that I have, I've had a good time solving those problems. And because when usually when they're solved, they're solved well. And you're like, all right, yeah, this is. You know, it's not as smooth as the built-in Steam experience because I'm launching an external launcher from Steam. And uh, okay, all right. Um, but then, yeah, the the and, and some people do that on Steam as well. People have come up with different weird hacks that you can use to kind of, you know, if you want to underclock certain aspects of things to to do a little bit of that and and you know generate a little bit less heat and and so on and so forth. Um, some people are into that and 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 more power to them. Or I guess less, I guess less, less power to more battery life to, to them. Um, I, yeah, I, this, this is, this, this device feels like something that needs to go back to the lab. Um, like it's, it's, it feels okay in the hand. I think the sticks are a little too loose for my taste. I was trying to play call of duty with it. And had maybe the worst game of Call of Duty I've ever had in my life on this device because the sticks feel so loose and and everything else. Performance wise, it was there, you know, it was, it was running good frame rate and um you know, a lot of the settings turned up. I played a, some Street Fighter Six on it and that ran well. Like games run well. Again, like at the end of the day, it is more powerful than the Steam Deck, like in terms of parts and resolution and whatever else. The resolution creates an interesting issue because it's like, oh, it runs at a higher resolution than the Steam Deck does. So yes, it's a more powerful device, but because it's pushing a higher resolution, then sometimes the gains, the, the performance gains are eaten up by the higher res. And so some people are dropping down to 720 for some games. But in my experience, like the stuff is, is run generally fine and i spent a bunch of time setting up emulation stuff and um you know playstation 3 stuff runs fine on it as it does on the steam deck uh you know but i was playing a bunch of afterburner climax on it and i'm like yep now nah, this this runs good full frame rate like very fast like all all that sort of stuff uh you know you can get retro arch and you know it's a windows machine you can install shit on it like that that's not you know that shouldn't be a, a big surprise, but you know, hey, you, you get your retro arch in there and earn your retro achievements and and all of that. Um, and because it's Windows, like I, you know, I have learned a lot about Linux and and fucking around with Linux over the years. Um, and I've forgotten most of it and learned a little bit of it back when I started tinkering with the Steam Deck. Um, but I, you know, I, Windows is, is more of a solved problem, I would say, in the grand scheme of things for me personally. So it's real easy. You're just like, no, okay, I know most of the quirks of how to do things on a fucking Windows install. You know, installing stuff outside of the start menu, you know, all of the other, like, so how to, how to get to things and make things happen. It's, it's not that, it's not that difficult. Um, for some people it is, and, and, and for those people... I guess EmuDeck, the software package that people use to install a bunch of emulators onto the Steam Deck, they're going to do a Windows version, which I just look at and go like, I, it's Windows. You don't need to install a big pile of stuff. It's Windows. You just do it. it but I guess some people are not up to snuff on those things. And so a, a package, a, a package that installs all of that shit automatically makes a ton of sense. For, for those people. Um, yeah. So I don't know. There's, there's, uh, it's got a fingerprint sensor on the power button, which I thought was kind of cool. So when you're, when you're logging into it, um, which it, it forgot my fingerprint and I had to redo it, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I did redo it. Uh, and so as you're powering it on, you are actually also, if you're using the right finger, you are you are authorizing your account and it is going to log you in as soon as it turns on boots up really quickly it has a i had to go into the bios and turn off a sound effect because it's got a little shing 
little animation that always plays, even if the audio is turned all the way down, it always plays that sound unless you go into the BIOS and turn the sound off. Um, which is real stupid. I, yeah, this thing, it's close, you know, like the, the idea of a more powerful device than the Steam Deck that doesn't have the shortcomings of of Linux, you know, that it's just like, hey, it's just Windows. So yes, it runs, like you don't have to worry about all the anti-cheat weird shit. Like it's just fucking Windows. So just have it go. Um, Like there's some appeal there, but I think the, the again, the for me, the killer is, well, the, the, the there's a couple of killers really. It's that I don't think the analog sticks feel good and I don't want to play any precision shooter, you know, the, the games that are being blocked by anti-cheat, I don't want to play on this device with these sticks. Um, and then the software experience with Armory Crate and the, you know, three different places to find updates and everything else, I think is terrible. Just a terrible experience. And I, it seems like the sort of thing that people are going to stumble over and be like, I don't even know how to make it install stuff because I can't find which Asus installed bloatware app has the updates in it because there's two of them. Um, Brent asks, do you think this is a wait for the second or third generation device deal? Yeah, uh, it could certainly improve. I think, I, I guess I would look at it as it's work that Windows could be doing and i think windows did you know the the people at microsoft did say like oh yeah we'd, we'd love to help support devices in this form factor and and you know whatever we can do with windows to make it something that is a, a bit easier to use on a device like this like yes we would love to look into doing it and and, and all of that but that's you know that's not today um so you know if they decide to kind of arc the OS in a direction that does make it friendlier for these kind of handheld machines, then I think these handheld machines will get better because you will eventually get to a point where you won't need garbage like Armory Crate to, which, which by the way, Armory Crate is, is primarily there as a launcher. It's supposed to read what games and other installer, like, like launchers you have installed and give you a big grid of those. And some portion of the time, it doesn't seem to show all of the steam games I have installed. And then I'll reboot and, it, and you know, Call of Duty will be there and then I'll reboot and it won't be, you know, it's, it's real. It's not even good at doing that. Um, and so for me, that that's the thing that really breaks the experience. It's a neat device. I, and I, but I, I think I might return it. Um, I was initially thinking like, oh, I'll get it. And, you know, if, if, hey. If it doesn't work out and I want to go back to the Steam Deck, I'll have a weird Windows machine that I can plug in in a closet somewhere. It's kind of cool to have something in this tiny form factor that I could just like plug in and be like, I don't know, I got another server. Plug some hard drives into it. Um, or whatever. But, uh, oh, one more thing. I, this, is, this is me. This is a, a me thing uh, with how I like to with how I like to work with Windows machines. This thing comes with Windows 11 Home installed on it, not Pro. Um, and I, I didn't realize that that was a thing that mattered until I was like, oh shit, I can remote desktop into this and then have a mouse and keyboard and then actually install all these updates in a reasonable human-like manner. And that'll be good. That'll, it's nice that I'll be able to do that at least but it's Windows 11 Home, and you cannot remote desktop into a home machine. Um, so I put Pro on it. That's something there are you can get you can get keys around. Uh, but if you if you do that through the Microsoft Store, they want a hundred dollars for you to go to Windows Pro. Uh, that is too much money <laughs> for the difference between Home and Pro. I feel. Um, but um, yeah, now I can remote desktop into it, and that's uh, that's most that's very convenient. Uh, you could obviously install if you if you are using a third party remote desktop solution. Like I'm sure all of that shit just works, right? Um, 
but I just, I have pro on all these other machines. I'm using all the, you know, like I, I am basically running, I have, well, right now it's just two machines, the one I'm sitting in front of, and then my server machine that's in the closet. Um, but I have another machine out in the garage and I can remote into that, um, and, and so on and so forth. But you know, because it's windows, you can set up windows file sharing and you can access the SD card that way, you know, on, um, on the Steam Deck, I set up a, a SFTP. Like you, you turn on SSH, and then you can, you know, you can connect to the machine remotely that way and install and copy files over your network. And that's been that's been great. That's been very convenient. Um, Windows file sharing slightly more convenient because I'm just like fuck it. I can drag folders over here and uh, just drag shit onto this SD card and have it copy over the network and and just have it go that way. And that's been that's been decent. Slow sometimes, but decent. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, playing games, uh, <laughs> I guess. Well, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about playing games. Uh, the first time I tried to launch Call of Duty, I hit the play button, and it just sits there. And then the play button turns off, like I'd never pressed it, and it never tried to launch the game. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Turns out you can't launch it in big picture mode. So I had to quit out, at least for the first launch. So I had to quit out of big picture mode, launch it from desktop mode. And then it pops up all the administrator, you know, pop-ups that it needs for first install. And once it was past that, now it, now it works. But it was like this horrible situation. It was like, all right, one of the two games that you're like, oh, isn't it convenient that I can, um, isn't it convenient that I can play Call of Duty on this device? Like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't even try to boot. What the fuck is going on? Um, but yeah, in, in terms of, again, you know, in terms of uh, power and ability and, and all of that, kind of once you navigate through all of that muck, it's a, you know, a reasonably compelling device in terms of it runs those games well and they look great on that screen. Um, but as I've spent more time with it and now that I'm here talking through it with you, it is really solidifying my position of just like, I should get rid of this thing. I should return this to the store. This is not worth it. The, the, the $750 that, uh, that I paid for this thing, uh, for a 512 gigabyte, uh, hard drive in it, uh, which, you know, you, you could, if you, if you, if you want to start tinkering more and more, you could go get a two terabyte drive and slap it in there. Apparently quite easily. Uh, the steam deck is a, is a little bit of a, a trickier install, I guess, by comparison. Um, so some people have done that. Uh, is there any cellular capability? Absolutely not. It's not a Vita. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I am incredibly disappointed with it. Uh, pretty well across the board. It's not, it's not a great experience. I think that, again, the, the hardware itself, um, the internals are fine. The sticks feel bad. The buttons feel bad. Um, and then, and then on the software end, having to deal with, um, armory crate and all of the other kind of cruft that they more or less for, uh, force on you. Um, I think is bad. It's bad. And some people will be, uh, really, some people will be very willing to jump through those hoops and they will, they will really want to go like, and, and I'm sure that the, as the community continues to develop around these issues, you will probably start to see more and more software that like, Hey, don't run armory crate. Instead, this thing will let you manage the button configuration and, and, and all this other stuff without having to deal with the trash ass application that is armory crate or may, maybe armory crate will get better. Anything's possible. Um, but I, um, I think I'm just going to go back to the steam deck at this point. Um, because again, I, 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 you know, the, the steam deck is for running steam games and, and again, for running a subset of steam games, cause they're going to be anti-cheat games that, you know, are never going to run on a steam deck, um, until you install windows on it. And then by virtue of installing windows on it, you're probably inheriting a lot of the issues that, you know, that, that you have to deal with here. Um, 
I don't need to play Call of Duty on a handheld device. Like when I think about the games that that I play that don't run on that, it's like Destiny 2 and Call of Duty and I'm not even playing Destiny 2 anymore and I don't want to play Call of Duty on a handheld all that much either way. Um so it's not that Yeah, that's not that compelling of an argument for me. Uh, being able to get Des uh, Diablo 4 running really well on a Steam Deck has, has really kind of, like, I think that that's a great, it's a great handheld experience. And it runs really well on this too. Um, and so it, that may be a case of like, oh, if, if the Steam Deck was totally incapable of running Diablo 4, but this was, that might, like, there might be like one or two games like that that would maybe push me over the edge and be like, well... I've at least got this thing configured the way I like it after spending literal hours upon hours fucking with it. Um, and so maybe I could see myself keeping it, but, but it, it, there's just, again, not enough games that kind of fit into that camp right now. Um, still just a fascinating market, right? I mean, I don't know about you, like I never would have thought that like the handheld PC market would get to a place where it, um, where we're even having these conversations because there's, there've always been people, you know, always been companies trying to go like, oh, look at this handheld gaming PC and it's got this tiny keyboard on it and we, we figured out a way to run windows on it. And, and for years, the, yeah, the, the OQO, yeah, yeah, like all those weird devices that, that just were coming from all these no name manufacturers and. And you'd look at it and go like, yeah, this thing looks like it could be fucking awesome, but it looks janky as shit. Um, it's cool that we're at a point now where that is starting to get cleaned up to the point where it starts to almost seem like a viable segment of the PC market, you know, someday. I'm not saying that like, you know, oh, so many millions of people own Steam Deck, you know, not right now, this is all still super nascent, but it's, you see it. You know, even in, even in the ROG device, you see bits and pieces where you're like, Hey, like there's a future where this actually is fucking, and, and I think it's really awesome right now. Like I, I love the steam deck. I think it's, you know, it's, it's got its limitations, but I, I think just in terms of, um, and I, I love their decision to run Linux on it and, and, and what that has done in terms of allowing them to fully customize the experience around their game launching software and they they provide a good number of ways to let you go deeper than that if you so choose but like by virtue of then building their own fork of an os for steam and and all the work they've done with proton to make windows games run under linux and all of that it's just so fucking cool um and it's cool that we're at this this point, you know, and and I really look forward to seeing what Valve ends up doing next in that space. Uh, whether, you know, what they do with updated hardware or just like kind of how they continue to evolve uh, SteamOS to to make this work. And, you know, of, of course, all the work they've done with Proton to make all of that so, so capable um, is just so impressive. And I, I think that like on paper, this, this is the, 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 the Asus ROG ally. I feel a similar way about it, you know, in terms of like the market, I just think this thing sucks. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe this device will get there again, you know, it, it's, I've seen a lot of people talking about returns for a variety of reasons. Um, including the SD card pop out thing that I've, I'm dealing with. Um, and, and so I'm sure that they eventually get some build quality under control on this and, and get to a point where the devices being sold in stores generally work and presumably the software. So even this, when I, when I first fired it up and was digging through armory crate and started looking online for, cause I realized like, wait a minute, this thing doesn't have a fucking Xbox button on it. How am I going to do any guide button stuff in any of the things that need that? Why would they not put that on there? There's gotta be a way to assign one of these back buttons to Xbox button or something like that. Um, and sure enough, the, you know, looking online there was, and then I looked at it and was like, Oh, 
that's how I started down the update path because the version of Armory Crate that was installed on it wouldn't let you do that. So that's even that's something that they recently went like, oh fuck, yeah, I guess, I guess we need to have a way to map an Xbox button on this goddamn thing. Shit, that's we should, yeah, we should have. Mm. Um, so even it was only after all those updates that I was able to even do that. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like it, it, you know, this hasn't soured me on the space or anything. I still think the handheld PC thing is. It's just really fascinating, um, but I, I don't think this device is right for right now. Um, and, you know, over, over time, if they get some of that stuff under control on the hardware side and they clean up the software a little bit better, then maybe this will end up being a smoother experience. But instead, I look at it and go like, nah, if they make another one of these down the line and make it a better device across the board... And also, Windows as an OS improves in ways that benefit use cases like this. I think that you'll start to see more high-quality devices on the market that feel closer to the integration that you get on the Steam Deck, you know, where it's like the, the OS is the launcher, you know, by default. And, and, and having that, I think, is, is, is powerful. So this thing's not there yet. And I, I don't think it's worth the money. And I don't think that the increase in power is worth it. I think that the initial sell for me was like, oh, it'll be very convenient to be able to run all of my Windows games on this Windows machine. But the hoops you have to jump through to make it all work uh, have not felt worth it to me. So, so there you go. I'm going to mess with it for a little while longer, but like I, I really feel like uh, getting this out of my system in front of you right now has actually really solidified my position on boxing this thing back up and returning it. Um, and now I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, so I have to go on now I have to unassociate that windows key with it because that's my windows pro key now. And I need to get that back and I need to, ugh, ugh. Um, anyway, um, and then get my account off it and everything. So I'm sure I'll have to format it, whatever else. Um, I've got a scary beverage here. Uh, the, the, the gentleman that sent in the case of Spike sent in four bottles of Redline Extreme. Sour heads. Um... There are multiple things written on this bottle that say it contains two servings. They've got a little gauge here to say like, hey man, you should stop drinking right here because this is two servings. But then when I looked at the website, uh, when I looked at the like vitamin, you know, the supplement, you know, the, the one of the online shops is selling it and they listed, you know, because they list the supplement uh, ingredients out. They treated it like it was just one serving and listed all the stuff. And I was like, oh, this doesn't seem... Like that much, but Redline has a reputation for being fucking crazy. Um, so I figured we'd try it. I'm a little, I'm a little scared about this one, honestly. Um, and I don't know if I should drink both or not. Yeah, this is from the same company that makes Bang. But this is like their, you know, this is the real shit. Um, smells a little sour. Smells a little powdery. Smells a little powdery. It doesn't taste like anything. It doesn't, um, like it's a little, it's a little sour. It's meant to be sour heads. They also have a blue raz flavor. Um, but it kind of doesn't, 
It's non-carbonated. It's um, it's got kind of an aftertaste, a mild aftertaste to it, but there's like. It's a little sour, like there's a little bit of flavor up front, but it immediately, it, it dissipates really quickly. Um, it's weird. It's weird. It's, this is really, uh, this, um, I don't really know what to make of this. It's not a refreshing beverage. It's not, you know, it's not something you would go like, ah, yes. A nice cool drink for me. Um, let's bring up the list here. Um, it's this is a again. This is Redline Extreme Sour Heads. All right, so that's I've I've drank slightly below the halfway mark. And I guess I should be do the, the responsible thing and and put a cap on it? I don't know. I don't know. That I I don't know what to make of this. Is this is this like a is this going to be a situation where I'm going to be like in 10 minutes go like these edibles ain't shit and then drink the rest of it and then go like, ah, or, or what? Um, this doesn't, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm underwhelmed. I almost feel like I need to not put this on the list yet because I need to see if it's going to do anything to me. I mean, obviously, this is the shit that they're selling at vitamin stores and, um, you know, as, as a, you know, this is, this is again, where this is even further over the line into pre-workout. Um, as opposed to the, you know, convenience store, like, you know, Ghost is, is really kind of pre-workout in a, in a lot of ways too. Um, but uh yeah i don't know let's uh let's close the list and we'll just we'll just try to remember to return to it later on and see if this shit hits me at all um i don't know what to make of that i feel like i just drank some really some weird water and now and now here we are um Anyway, other video game stuff, uh, Mortal Kombat 1 held its online stress test over the weekend. Uh, I played a little bit of it on Friday and had a little bit of time to, to dip into it here and there over the weekend. But um, this was pretty much the same version of the game as far as I could tell. Uh, very similar to what I played in LA a few weeks ago uh, in terms of available characters and backgrounds and cameo characters and, and, and everything else. Um, and so it was nice to be able to get a little bit, uh, more time with it and also to kind of get it online. Um, I didn't, I did not know. I, I don't know a lot of other people that got into this and I, I, I don't under, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if they were, you know, it's supposed to be an online stress test. So, so I thought that maybe they, you know, would, would get a lot of people in there and, and maybe they did. And it just, you know, the people that I know didn't get picked or, or whatever, but I it did not see a lot of other people talking about playing the game over the weekend. Um, and, uh, the people that were playing the game, if you watched the stream on Friday, <laughs> uh, which is up on YouTube now, if you want to see it, um, I just got, I just got wrecked, man. I got destroyed. It seemed very much like, because I, I doesn't feel like they did necessarily a great job of promoting that the online stress test was happening. Um, I knew about it because I, I knew about it. I got, I got emails from them about it <laughs> saying that it was coming up. 
Um, but I, I don't know that they necessarily did a great job of getting out there and, and promoting that it was happening. So I wonder, I don't, I don't know how they did with signups or whatever, but it seems like the only people that were really in the know about it, or the only people that I ran into while I was playing were, especially Friday morning, as soon as it opened up were rough folks. They were better at that game than I will probably, they were already better at that game than I will probably ever be. Um, and man, just seeing people like putting together combos and already incorporating the cameo fighters and finding new ways to keep these combos going. It was really cool <laughs> um, to see a lot of that stuff in action. Um, and I had a, I had a good time with it, but also I was getting so fucked up left and right that I was just like, okay, well, all right, uh, um, this is, it's not necessarily fun to get wrecked over and over again in that game because, again, these combos, you know, if you, if you cannot break the combo, if you've already used your combo breaker, um, you, you're going to be in the air for a while. <laughs> um, and so that was, that was my experience. Also, you know, we, we saw some matches crash out. We saw, you know, obviously they... They're building this as a as an online stress test, and you know things broke several times, getting disconnected from matches and, and whatever else. So you know, hopefully, it was effective for them in terms of actually testing out their infrastructure and and getting things going. I had some matches that felt off, um, where you know just the the jump felt like it was coming out late, like everything felt heavier than normal. Where it was like I just like I'm hitting these inputs. And they're just taking a little bit longer to come out. And for a while, if you, if you go watch the video, I'm like, I'm like playing here on this monitor, which is split out after my capture card. And then I've got another output that goes to the TV. That's like two links further down the chain. So it's like, theoretically, it's going to have less input latency and whatever else. Um, and so it was this feeling of like, wait a minute, am I, am I playing better on the television than I am on this thing is, is, is there more latency coming from this or that or what? Um, but it didn't feel like traditional rollback to me and when the, the latency. So I, I, I don't, I don't think it was my setup, but I can't say for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a, I think it's a really interesting game. Um, <laughs> but I, I got the shit beat out of me over and over again. So, you know, um, so there, there's, there's that, uh, and that's over now. They, they ran that through, I think Monday morning, uh, yesterday morning. And, uh, and now that's gone, which I guess is not that big a deal because it's almost July and the game is out in September. So it's really, it really is kind of right around the corner. Huh? Um, and, uh, I am very curious to see that full game when it comes out. I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what characters are in it. Um, there have been some leaks around supposed playable characters and um, a number of players from the, from gosh, from MK4 are even listed. I, and there was a, I, there was something, I think someone posted a picture of Reiko like months ago and Ed Boone responded to it. Somebody responded to it. I think it must have been Ed. Um, in a way that made me think, shit, man, they're gonna put fucking Reiko in this game. And looking at the leaks, they might be putting Reiko in this game, along with Nitara, and which is you know a little later than MK4. But I want Kai. If we're gonna go back to Mortal Kombat 4 characters, I think Kai was the only character in that game that was new that I played a lot of. Um Tanya was on the list of leaked characters and, and you know, so it's hard to say if that stuff's legit or not. It probably is like, you know, fighting game rosters live to get leaked. That's, that's what they're there for. They're not there to get slowly announced and rolled out. Um, but I didn't see, you know, in, in the, the leaked list of, uh, you know, they're showing some cameo characters and stuff. I did not see striker on that list, but striker is, it was in the footage I saw. I, maybe they didn't put that footage out. Um, but no, well, that footage was in the, in the Keeley stuff, wasn't it? I, yeah, he was in that trailer. Yeah. So he, he was in the trailer, another trailer that we saw when we went to see it at the summer games fest, uh, event. 
and played the game. Um, and so, yeah, okay, he was in the he was in the publicly released trailer. Okay, yeah, so Strikers in in the game is a cameo fighter for sure. Um, but I, I I didn't see that. Like people are building lists of who's in the game and who's not, and I just he was not on the list, and I was like, well, I mean, he's in the fucking trailer. Why is he not on this list? Which then made me wonder if any of that list is legit. Um, it probably is. We'll see. We'll see. I, I, yeah, I, I don't really know what to, what to make of that, but I, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see the story in that game. There's little bits, you know, when you're doing versus matches, the characters talk to each other in a pre-fight context, and there's just a little bit of information there as the characters are jawing at each other that make me want to know so much more about the state of that universe and the state of that timeline or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, the, you know, I, I, I really want to see more of that game and I really want people to get their hands on it who are not, um, straight up murderers and not everyone I played against was a straight up murderer, but they could murder me. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, Definitely want to see a wider range of skill levels playing the game um, so that maybe I can get a, a, a few more uh, wins in there or just, you know, like, like learn stuff. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, it was fun to play it, but by the end of it, I was like, man, I'm getting the fucking shit kicked out of me. This is, this is, uh, this is a bit much. Um, I'm starting, I'm trying to assess myself, you know, trip report here. Um, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. I'm feeling a little, um, a little something. Feeling a little, feeling a little something. Um, but I can't tell. Um, now this is empty, but there's a little bit left in here. Um, yeah, so, so that's, um, and I've been playing the AEW game, but we can't talk about that right now. Uh, let's get into the news. Nintendo Direct happened last week. Nintendo went ahead and, um, put together a list of things that they intend to release primarily over the rest of this year. Uh, and this is, huh. there were some announcements in this thing that made me very angry slash sad, but also this might be the best one of these they've ever done. That's a, uh, I'd have to go back and see what other Nintendo directs they have done. But I will say in terms of some announcements that you look at and like realize, Hey, these games are kind of right around the corner. Uh, I came out of this thing going, oh, hell yeah. Fuck, this is the this is the best I've felt about Nintendo first party uh, in a while between uh, Tears of the Kingdom coming out and then, you know, the, the batch of games announced here. Uh, I think leading the pack is a remake of Super Mario RPG, which is an amazing video game. Um... And they are putting out a remake in November. Uh, it looks fantastic. Uh, it, it's nice to see it in like full real 3D. The original game, if you remember correctly, back on the SNES, was done in that pre-rendered 3D style that Donkey Kong Country and Killer Instinct on the SNES used. And uh, that always... Um, that style, uh, that graphical style, especially... With Nintendo trying to spin it as we've got 3D graphics, um, that style was always a fucking scam. Donkey Kong Country is for losers. Um, and and Super Mario RPG was an amazing video game, but at the time, you know, I, I think that, that that kind of fake 3D look, I, I always kind of had a weird. It left a weird taste in my mouth. Um. And these days, decades later, removed from um, removed from the era of CRT TVs, 
that provide a nice filter to those visuals and make those graphics look a little smoother and easier on the eyes, uh, the original Super Mario RPG becomes a difficult game to emulate in a way that is that, that, that captures the impact that that game originally had. Um, and so doing a full remake, uh, I think is so fucking cool, man. Ah, oh, that's a great game. It's the game, like one of those things you're like, they should make a billion more of these. This fight system is so interesting. And of course they would go on to make more RPGs in the Mario universe and do some really neat things, uh, with that as well. Um, but nothing that was quite as cool as Super Mario RPG was in its day. Um, so it's awesome that that game's coming back. I'm, I'm really, that's just, that's, it's great. It's great. It's one of those kind of like unexpected things. You're like, man, that's so cool. That's a great way to tap into that. Um, they're going to make a new detective Pikachu, which great. They should that first game, like the, just the, 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 just the virtue of here's Pikachu wearing a fucking hat and talking tough. I know they went and made that movie, which I, you know, whatever. Um, but Detective Pikachu Returns will come out on October 6th. And I thought that that trailer looked pretty compelling uh, as well. Um, probably the, well, the other biggest thing uh, is a new 2D Mario game. A new, a new side-scrolling um, Mario game called Super Mario Brothers Wonder. And the pipes wiggle like worms and the, the Mario turns into an elephant and the, you're in the flower kingdom, whatever that is. Uh, and the, it, it looks like it, it, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it looks like the kind of modern 2d Mario template where you look at it and it's identifiable as like, Oh, this is the next game from the new super Mario brothers, uh, folks. Um, but then they take that art style and st st stretch it out and make it weird and do some weird shit with it. And, and there are like, I I'm curious if the game will end up looking like this because it's got speech bubbles that are showing up and the flowers are talking to you and all this, you know, there's just a lot of real crazy stuff with the, the art is, is again, stylistically, you feel like it's coming from the new super Mario brothers template, but so far advanced past that in ways that are even more cartoonish in, in, in like in, in kind of a mind blowing sort of way. Um, yeah. I, and, and I was going to get into the flower kingdom being from that. Is that that super Mario anime movie? And if, if they, if they tie it back into that, that would be real fucking weird. I'm getting like, I'm getting rushes now. I'm getting like that kind of like uh head rush sort of tingles. Um, in a way that I like at first I was like, it's because I'm so excited about super Mario brothers wonder. I was like, Oh no, this is, this is, this is that shit. <laughs> um, that game's out on October 20th. It looks like a crazy, just wiggly take on the Mario games. Um, and is it, you should go, if you have not seen it, go watch the bit of uh, super Mario brothers wonder that they put out. Uh, the video that they put out there, it is um, a sight to see. It is, it, it stands out. It, it is, it has become one of my most anticipated games for the remainder of the year. Uh, I came out of that going like, I need to play that. I absolutely have to play that. That looks killer. I'm very excited about that. Um, on the flip side, there's a new WarioWare coming out, which I was like fucking finally because the last WarioWare on switch i feel was tremendously disappointing in 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 a number of ways the gameplay system that they used of of having you select the different characters and having them have a different gameplay uh i thought was a you know, that's that's probably an interesting idea on paper and i think that it's terrible i think it's a it's a bad WarioWare game and then on top of that, it just didn't have the flavor and the unlockables and the cool extra shit that WarioWare normally has. And so WarioWare Move It is the game they have announced. Um, and it's out in November. It will have four-player local play. 
and it is kind of designed to be uh sort of like i guess this was, uh, the the Wii game was that smooth moves the 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 Wii WarioWare game they want you to take the joy cons you, you it just looks like you will not be able to play this on a switch lite and do shit with the joy cons put them on your knees and then bend back and forth and like all of the same kind of pose stuff where you're like i'm in mohawk pose and i put the Wii remote on top of my head um that stuff was a novel way to incorporate the Wii, but also it is on the bottom half of the WarioWare tier list for sure. Um, and so seeing a game that appears to be taking some of its cues from that particular WarioWare game um, was a real roller coaster ride for me watching that watching that video it was just like i fuck i don't want to this is not the WarioWare game i want to play like i yeah it, it was a uh, i i ended up being thoroughly disappointed by that announcement because i could really go for a really good uh, traditional is a weird word to use when it comes to WarioWare because they've always capitalized off of different gimmicks whether it's like this one's got a touch screen because it's on the fucking ds this one we put an extra tilt and you know sent we put a sensor in the cartridge so you can do this and we you know some of the different things that they have done with WarioWare over the years have have been all about you know exploiting the unique features of the hardware it is running on um and so this is in a lot of ways no exception you could argue that that last WarioWare was bad at doing that and maybe that's part of its problem um I'll certainly give it a shot um but it's you know I I'm really yeah i don't I'm sorry. it's not what i'm looking for out of a new warioware game i suppose um that's kind of the big stuff they showed pikmin 4 which I, for some people will be big stuff for me it is i'm sorry it is not um some other third party stuff the 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 batman arkham trilogy is coming to switch which sure um, I saw some reporting saying that the cartridge will only have the first game on it and you will need to download the other two, um, which I suppose is one way to keep costs down. Uh, there's a star ocean two remake coming that looked pretty good. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, some Pokemon DLC, you know, some other kind of smaller stuff that, you know, they, they showed the, the Mario and Rabbids DLC, this new dragon quest monsters coming. The Japanese version of the video got a new game from the, I guess the folks behind the Goemon games. So it's kind of a spiritual successor to that. It's not actually Goemon, but it's, you know, it seems like kind of set in that same conceptually similar. And that looked really good. Um, so hopefully that gets some kind of localized release. Um, my my daughter has kind of drifted away from playing Mario Kart. As I said last week, um, that she's just gotten bored with Mario Kart 8. But earlier in the week, she found the Switch and turned it on and somehow got into the news section of the Switch uh, where they, you know, they put up these videos and some of these trailers and, and everything. And she somehow stumbled her way. And I, I like I walked in here. And, and my kids, both of them were, were staring down. My, my daughter is about to turn four. My son will be two in a little bit. So they're, they're little. Um, and they had somehow gotten into the Switch's news section and were watching the Super Mario RPG trailer over and over again. And then she found the Super Mario Wonder trailer and was watching that over and over again. And, uh... And she's like, I want to see it because the, the, the Mario RPG trailer opens with uh, Princess Peach in it. Um, and so she was was watching that over and over again and, and, and seemed very intrigued by both of those conceptually. Uh, they did also announce, a new, speaking of, of games for my daughter, uh, they announced a new Princess Peach game would be coming along next year. Showed just a little hint of that. Um Super Princess Peach is a neat game. It's a conceptually weird, but yeah, they're gonna make a new Peach game, and that's awesome. They should do that. They should super fucking do that uh, for me, as well as as well as for her. Um, and so, like with with that stuff in mind, like you know, like not every game here is hitting for me personally. 
Um, but there was enough strong shit here that I came out of this feeling like, oh man, I'm, I'm actually, this might be this six month period might be the most I've used my switch since launch. Since I played Mario Odyssey and breath of the wild, you know, like th this is the, the, the switches entered a new, uh, a new era of excitement, I suppose. Um, and, and I was not expecting that, but, but Hey, here we are. Um, it's kind of, yeah, I, you know, there's, we've, we've started to have a little bit more conversation about the future of Nintendo and what their next hardware might be. You know, there was the Ubisoft comment about like, oh, we should have saved Mario and Rabbids for the next hardware. Um, and a few other kind of hints and things around the edges about, you know, the, the future, um, but these, you know, this batch of Switch games all look uh, exciting. Yeah, the, the, other, the other news was like they were saying like, hey, Nintendo accounts will move forward onto our next hardware. Like that was the, the kind of next little bit there um, that they intend to keep. That, this is a bold, a bold for them. They're going to keep the same account system from one platform to the next. That's crazy. You'd never think that that would work, but uh, I thought we'd have to create another account and then link it to our old account. And then if we could link in a friend ID from a console uh, handheld three generations ago, maybe we could tie it all together and blah, blah, blah. But um, they intend to finally use the Nintendo account system going forward uh, onto a next generation of hardware. Um, good on them. I guess, but you know, like those are details that like if, if they're giving those details out now, you know, you can start to safely assume that they've got a lot in mind about what that next platform is going to be. Um, and, uh, yeah, this drink is a lot. This is, uh, this, this is, um, Hmm. Uh, this, this is, I, I, uh, this, this red line is, is, uh, mildly shocking in a way where I was like, I'm going to drink the other half of it. Fuck this. And now I'm like, I am absolutely not going to drink the other half of this under no circumstances. Am I going to fucking drink the rest of this drink today? Um, and so I guess now we should maybe go back and put it on the list. It's I don't I, like, I don't know. It's, it's, this is not a fun energy. This is an antsy, this is like a panicky kind of energy. This is uh this doesn't feel, this is, I, I feel a, a little moisture forming on my arms and granted it is a warm day here and I am uh, closed up in this room that gets warm on its own anyway. But, um, yeah, this is not feeling amazing. Um, Which, uh, is it, is, it's not, a, I have to clean the entire house kind of energy. I, well, maybe it could be again. It's an antsy fucking like anxiety kind of like they're out to get me kind of energy. Uh, it's, it's a, I've got to take this clock radio apart because I know that the microphone is hidden in there somewhere and I've got to find it. Um, it's, it's like that. It's like a restless kind of like uh, fucking this window is mocking me. I've got to punch it out. Um, like it, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It's, it's, it's bad energy. This is, this is, it's methy in a, not that I've, not that I've done meth, but it, you know, the, the feeling that you tend to associate with people that are on meth having been around a lot of people that are on meth over the years. Um, this, there's nothing clean about this. It doesn't feel like, like a lot of en some energy drinks you drink. And when it comes on, it is a clean, like, ah, oh, oh, I feel elevated. I got lifted. And then it, you know, it backs off and and the back off is, you know, it's either going to be something that gives you some kind of weird withdrawal thing or that makes you go like, we've got to get more caffeine or, um, 
or not. This feels like I am like fucking this is bad craziness. This is bad energy. This this feel I don't I don't like this. I can't make it stop. I have no way to make it stop. I just have to fucking ride this out. Um this is with me now for the next however long it's going to be. Um and um I get why, you know, this, this is, this is something that again, as something that's like built as like pre-workout, I could see this leading to people going like, no, I've got to fucking lift weights. I've got to fucking lift weights right fucking now. Like we've got to lift these fucking weights. Arr. Um, I, I see, I see why that would, um, why that would, that would be there. Um, I, this this feels like shit. I'm going to put this on the list and then I'm going to go get some water because I, I, I don't feel fucking good. Um, okay. Um, where's this go on the list though? Like, that's the thing. Like in terms of just like a drink that you drink that does something to you, this is maybe the most something has been done to me since we started keeping track of the list. But this doesn't feel this is not a good feeling. This feels fucking bad. And it tastes like basically nothing. You know, it, the sour heads is not a prominent flavor. It, it this just tastes like thick sugary liquid, a thick syrupy syrup. Uh that fucking got me that made me crazy. I can feel my jaw tightening up. I can feel like a like a um like i can feel a real fucking mania coming on you know um which you know hey that's cool that's cool that it does something it's nice to know you can still feel um i've been drinking more of these spikes lately they don't do much for for how much caffeine they claim to have um they they don't they don't really pack much of a punch but i would much rather drink a spike than drink this you know like this this doesn't this is this doesn't feel nice is it sugar-free yeah i believe this is a, this is a zero it's zero calories like all the other stuff is um and, um, we're going places today. Um, I don't know how to rate this. I honestly don't know how to rate this. It's, uh, it's a real fucking roller coaster, but I hate it. I fucking hate it. Uh, I, I hate the way this makes me feel. Um, it has, it does not have a lot of flavor to it, but it does not taste bad, but do not drink this recreationally under no circumstances. Like, like th this is all of the other drinks on this list are fun time, happy drinks of like, Hey, I went to the gas station and I got a beverage and now I feel a little elevated. Like, hmm. <laughs> Um, this is like, Hey man, I met a guy around back the gas station behind the car wash and he sold me this bag. And now, now we're going to go fly helicopters in the war. Now I'm going to take my submersible and smuggle drugs into the country. Um, and I don't know where to put this. I, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. Um, it doesn't, it's a separate thing. It's a, it's a totally, and now that I've, now I, I felt that warm moisture and now that my skin is a little damp, it's getting cool. And so that's kind of nice. Like that, I'm going to shiver a little bit because I'm getting cold. <laughs> um, it's a nice clammy feeling. Does my body crave more? Absolutely not. My instead the the what I'm having the the thought process that's going through my head is not 
uh, is, is not, do I crave more? It's, should I hang on to this or dispose of it immediately? It's, should I, because I have three more bottles of this, as well as this half bottle, do I hang on to this in case I need it later? Or do I get all of this out of here before something bad happens? Right now, I'm going to set this down. I'm not going to make that call just yet. But after the show, I'm either going to stand up and put this in the fridge, or I'm going to stand up and throw it into the street and laugh maniacally. Pour it into the street so the lizards can drink it, and we're all staying up all night, baby. The lizards go inside when the sun goes down, but not anymore. Because me and the lizards, we've got red line. <sighs> um, yeah, it's rough stuff, man. It's, uh, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel good. Um, but it's effective if you had to drive a truck. <laughs> Get a bunch of these and, uh, you know, fuck white line fever. We're going to get red line fever. Um, I can't rate this. I, I don't know. This, this is such a, this is such a fucking other thing. Like I want to put it at the bottom with an asterisk next to it and just be like, dog, don't. Um, and so I'm going to go down here. Red line, what is the full name of this? Red line extreme, implying that there's a regular red line out there that's, you know, for cowards and bitches. Um, red line extreme, sour heads. Thanks to you, I uh, was it Yusef? I, 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 I don't have the name in front of me. Of, of I'm, I'm genuinely, um, the, the caffeine, how much caffeine does it claim to have? That's, if you go to the website, it looks like it only has 300 and something like the. They are rating it by the whole bottle, and it seems like it maybe only has like 400 milligrams or something like that. It, like the caffeine was not the major number in there, because instead it was just like a proprietary blend. Um, and whatever they're putting in their proprietary blend, is wild. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Only you say only 300 LOL. That's a lot. Not 300 is, is kind of like the upper limit for a lot of these drinks. That spike, I believe has 350. Um, and you know, yeah, I suppose that is a lot, but with most of the drinks we're drinking here are somewhere in the 200 to 300 range. Rain is 300. Uh, rockstar exdurance is 300 bangs. I believe are 300. Um, Anyway, I'm going to stand up and go get a drink of water and bring that back. Um, and we're going to continue with the news. Hold tight. I'll be right back. Hey, we're back. I got this water. Um, yeah, I just, I want to, um, you know, what would really pair well with red line extreme is, uh, breaking a lot of glass like shattering a bunch of windows with your fists 
Goldberg style. Just forearm smashing car windows, you know? You know what would go really well, what would pair really well with Redline Extreme? Setting fire to a cop car. Um, would, would be nice. Smashing fluorescent light tubes over your back and head would go really well with this. Um... Yeah, uh, hitting a bike with a metal bat for a few hours. That would feel real nice right about now. Um, anyway, what else is going on in the news? Uh, a lot of Xbox news kind of coming to light. The uh, FTC, the old Federal Trade Commission, uh, is... Uh, trying to block the merger of Activision, Blizzard, and Microsoft, the acquisition. Um, and so as they've been doing that, they've been pouring over a ton of different internal emails from the past few years. And a lot of it is redacted, but you end up with little bits and pieces here of um, Microsoft's strategy and Sony's reaction there to it and, and, and so on. I'd pull, you know, this is something we could have spent like seven hours talking about. Um, Steven Totillo on Twitter has been doing a really good blow by blow of the hearing and posting a lot of pictures of the redacted documents. And, and so if you really want to get, um, a good look at that stuff, I would go check him out, uh, and go see, you know, like he's, he's posting summaries, uh, to the Axios gaming section, I guess. Um, as well, um, but over the course of this, you know, other people have been reporting on it as well. The Verge has a story here saying Microsoft considered acquiring Bungie and Sega to bolster Xbox Game Pass. Internal emails show, um, and so yeah, it, it's a this is an email from from November of 2020. Phil Spencer, you know, kind of inquiring or, or seeking permission internally. Uh, to open conversations with some of the these publishers that they were interested in acquiring, um, we and, and there's in this email says we believe that Sega has built up a well balanced portfolio of games across segments with global geographic appeal and will help us accelerate Xbox Game Pass both on and off console. This is an email to like the CFO and the CEO of Microsoft. It's him trying to justify, hey. Can you give us strategic approval to go open these conversations with these publishers um, to see if we can buy them? I think that the very idea that Bungie is a company that Microsoft was thinking about acquiring again is hilarious. <laughs> um, and a tweet resurfaced from around the same time for people saying like, hey, you know, there's a rumor going around that like, hey, Microsoft is looking at maybe buying Bungie. And then like Pete Parsons of Bungie being like, that's not true. It's like bullshit. Look, it's, it's definitely true. But maybe, you know, maybe they never got the strategic approval and maybe they never approached Bungie about it, I suppose, is uh, is maybe the the situation there. But uh, uh, they probably had some talks before, at, at least before. Assume that everyone talked to everyone before signing any paperwork you know if Bungie's going to get sold to sony you can bet that at one point they hit up microsoft if microsoft had not hit them up already to say like hey i mean what do you think um there's kind of a, a longer list here i think you know the the sega acquisition stuff that's just something that has made sense for a lot of years but also, um, like strategically, I think Sega would be a good acquisition for Microsoft. And that's dating back to the days of the original Xbox. <laughs> you know, um, for 20 years, Microsoft has been thinking about buying Sega or something, um, depending on which stories you believe. Um, and also, in the email, they do kind of cite the... Uh, the mobile portfolio of Sega that they have a, a, a better presence on mobile phones in Asia. Uh, and that's something that appeals to them because, you know, and, and I think that underscores 
some of the things they've tried to say about this Activision purchase because they they try to say like, oh, Call of Duty's cool, but really King is the thing we want because they've got Candy Crush and they're a big mobile. We need better mobile stuff. And, you know, it's easy to look at that and go like, that's smoke and mirrors. You really just want to get Call of Duty on Game Pass. But you look at these emails from a few years ago, it's definitely like they're looking at the entire portfolio you know they're, they're looking at these entire portfolios and and they it seems like they have been consistently thinking about ways to be better on mobile um better than they are now they, they have not microsoft has not had a great presence on mobile ever right i mean not since wordament came out on ios have i felt good about a microsoft published uh mobile product um and that's a great one because you can get achievements on a phone game that's crazy um there was that other thing, I guess it's technically them because it's Bethesda, but there was a Doom, a mobile game, a, a Doom mobile game that came out this year Um, that's like kind of a little top-down shooter. It's a really weird fit for the franchise. Like they try to work in the glory kills of like modern Doom and, but it's this weird corridor-based thing. Mighty Doom, yes, Mighty Doom is it called. I could not remember it, but... Uh, it's, I, I played it for a little while and uninstalled it. It just, it was not great. Doom RPG is an amazing mobile Doom game. Uh, and Doom, Doom RPG 2 was also quite good. Um, and, uh, well, I don't know th that crackdown mobile game for windows phone. I got some achievements in that project sunbreak, I believe it was called, but like, yeah, Microsoft's mobile stuff has been. Um, small potatoes over the years, I suppose. Um, so, you know, Bungie and Sega are the ones that get kind of the big, uh, headline call out here, but there's a, an M and a final watch list here that includes some additional studios and lists their assets out that they were looking at thunderful. And the asset there is expertise in cross gen casual mobile games. Super Giant Games, developer of top indie titles including Hades, which is interesting. Um, I want, yeah, man, like that's, huh? The idea that they would go and buy a, a just a, a traditional, well, traditional, an, an indie studio. I mean, that has made like you know some very wonderful games that have sold quite well. I guess it makes a lot of sense. It's just like kind of a weird. When you think about the things that Microsoft is trying to solve um, in via acquisition, Supergiant is one that kind of sticks out as like, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, they don't really have a wide portfolio, but every game they put out has been a banger. So, you know, um, Niantic is on the list here, which would be pretty weird. The idea of Microsoft kind of technically publishing a Pokemon game. Um, Playrix, which is not a, a company I'm familiar with but it's just the, the it says strong franchises and content br content breadth world class in designing making and running successful games and that's the same sentence they wrote next to zynga so they were at some point considering purchasing zynga zynga would eventually go on to be published by i believe it was 2k um and uh then they also have scopely which is a, a mobile Company are very strong tech infrastructure to support non-owned IP opportunity to complement Xbox Game Studios IP. Scopely makes. I have been debating how much I want to talk about this because it's you know, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about a fucking bad mobile game because there are a billion bad mobile games. Scopely is responsible for a game called Star Trek Fleet Command, um, which I have had installed for a few months now. Um, and it is an abysmal product. It has the look and feel of Star Trek. It has the kind of L cars, little bleeps and bloops and, and some of that stuff that you want out of a Star Trek experience that you go like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It's kind of got this stuff. And, and you're, you're building up a space station and you're building different ships and you're taking your ships out and doing missions and, um, it is a timer game 
you 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 can sit there and upgrade nine thousand different little terminals inside your station, and there's eight different research trees, and you find shards to upgrade your officers, and everything takes fucking forever, and everything in the shop is like a hundred bucks. And so it's this game where it's like, okay, you want to bring your your level from twenty two to twenty three. You need to not upgrade all of these other items. And even then, when you get there, you need to touch this button and then wait four fucking days. So it's weeks of timers. Of like, okay, I need to upgrade this item until it gets to level 18 or 19. And then once that's done, I can upgrade this item to this point. And then once these are all level 22, then I can push this button to bring this main building up to level 23. And then I can do it all over again. And then it is a multiplayer kind of PVP experience where people are forming alliances and all of this other stuff. And um, it seems like it attracts the worst fucking people. Um, where like they have established some rules to the world that are not really built into the game. And they have all spent the, so much money or time or both where it's like, their ships are two to three times more powerful than yours at the same le like character level. And you're like, oh, well, there's no way I can stop them from raiding my base over and over again unless I use these shields that cost a currency to keep running. And, oh, wait. Uh, and so it's like at one point some of the other alliances were like messaging the head of the alliance that I was in to say like, oh, you need to get on this Discord so we can really negotiate about the rules of engagement and all. And it was just like, shut the fuck up, you fucking nerds. Like, get the, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? This is a miserable experience. And you want to, oh yeah, I want to get on Discord so I can, you know, talk about our alliance infrastructure and all, like, get fucked. Jesus Christ. Um, just insane and so i've had the star trek fleet command installed for a few months and i open it up every three days uh at about four o'clock in the morning when my it's, it's a good thing when my son wakes up uh sometime between two and four o'clock a.m i can open it up and start the next set of timers shake my head at it and go this is fucking terrible um and then and then not think about it for days on end it's just a terrible product like like in terms of a game it being a game and the things you do in it like i you know it, it has all of the kind of like oh hey it's got all these characters from across all the different star treks and you know you can kind of bring them in and put them on your ship and oh you can build all these different ships and you can build the botany bay and you're like oh that's neat and Khan is here and like oh look at that you know so like from like a star trek lore perspective is like something of a star trek fan over the years i'm like oh well this is neat um, and then you spend more time with it and you're like, this is a fucking, this is maybe one of the worst examples of like a timer driven, Hey, you can give us money to speed past the timers, uh, sort of product that I have seen in years. Like, I didn't even think they still made games like this anymore. Cause I thought that all the mobile developers had like smartened up about like, Oh, we need to figure out a way to like. We need a, a, a more of a spoonful of sugar here to make this seem like an actual game. These people are like, no, man, fuck it. <laughs> more timers. More timers and more currencies that don't explain themselves. They're like, ah, yes, here, uh, the, this timer is expired, and now you can collect more orb splinters. Like, ah, good, what are orb splinters for? I don't know, man, Google it. Like, it's just, it's, it's fucking crazy. It is crazy how fucking terrible that thing is. Um, anyway, Microsoft thought about buying Scopely. Uh, they also thought about IO Interactive, owner of AAA franchises with specialized expertise in regional IP game launches. Um, that would have been an interesting pickup for Game Pass. I mean, the Hitman people, uh, I could have seen that. I, I, I you could have seen something like that happen. And then Bungie, Bungie. Again, again, the idea of Microsoft saying like, we want another round of that. It went so great last time. Let's, uh, let's get Bungie back in the fold. I mean, uh, to be fair, like some of those people have left and whatever else, but like the, the, just 
that would have been hilarious if they had actually managed to purchase Bungie. But of course, you know, they ended up getting wrapped up in this uh, Activision thing. And uh, we'll see what ends up happening there, if, if that ends up going through or not. I, I, I don't know where the current uh, betting line is. Um, or, or not, but, but there you go. If they had brought Bungie in... Do you think if they had brought Bungie in? Yeah, okay, there's a little bit more here. Acquisition of Bungie will include securing valuable IP, Destiny and its community, and integrations of its dev and live ops infrastructure into Xbox Game Studios. Um, Destiny, they, they noted that Destiny, one of the, one of the highest hours generating titles on console Game Pass. Um, do you think that they would have ever put 343 and Bungie back together? Or would they have, do you think that they would have said like, hey, you guys, you guys want to take a crack at this, uh, this Halo thing? You guys, want, you guys want to maybe take a look at this Halo thing? You guys know anything about this? Or did all the Halo people stay and, and end up going over to 343? You know, do you, you, you want to maybe... Do they end up merging those studios? Do they end up, yeah, there's a lot of weird. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like Bungie has had so many years out on its own that it's become effectively a different thing, you know? And so it would be weird bringing them back in the fold and, and, and be like, Hey, come on, come on back in and, and all is forgiven. We're going to give you these people and you guys are in charge of Halo. Or would they have been like, we do not want to touch Halo. Like as part of this, we will advise you on Halo, but for the love of God, no one here wants to work on a Halo game or they would have left and gone to 343 years ago. Um, we're working on Marathon. Please leave us alone. Uh, yeah, that's an, a lot of interesting what-ifs uh, across across that. Um, you know, a little bit more of the Xbox shit here, which I literally have written under a heading of more Xbox shit. Um Sony said that it would withhold, um, you know, this is uh, Jim Ryan speaking in a deposition here in this case. Jim Ryan said that if the deal closes, Sony couldn't tell Activision about its next console. Um, and that he went on to talk about, you know, kind of working with, with Mojang after Microsoft bought them. And that part of this is why it why you didn't get a PlayStation 5 version of Minecraft because Sony did not provide them with uh dev kits early on in the cycle. Uh and this is a weird um like on one hand this is like a well yeah of course you wouldn't give dev kits to a competing company but the way these things get run and the way these things get separated out into different divisions, there's a there's a legal framework for hey, we're going to provide this highly confidential, highly sensitive, competitive information to an arm of your company. They cannot tell people working on the Xbox division about it, or we will sue you into the dirt. Like that sort of stuff is not out of the question. And so I look at this as Sony being a little melodramatic about it. Um, because again, I, I think there are frameworks that have existed in situations like this where you've got, you know, hey, we, we have information about this competing product here. And, you know, when switch dev kits and stuff like that went out, you know, like, like people had to do, had to do stuff like that. Um, and so this strikes me as Jim Ryan giving a deposition that is painting this in the worst possible light, but that this is something that there would have been a way to work through this uh, if they really wanted to. So I, I, I don't know how much I, I buy that specific uh, answer, but, um, you know, the, the other kind of interesting stuff here, you know, is a lot of emails from over the years, uh, you know, that, that make Microsoft not seem as 
friendly as perhaps they are in a public setting. You know, they talk a lot about like, oh, gaming is best when everyone is doing this. And, you know, that's certainly um, makes a lot of sense. But then you have a lot of behind the scenes emails from over the years where they're just like, no, if we could put Sony out of business, we absolutely would love to do that. Uh, from, you know, 2019. And, and they're writing that off as being like, oh, that's an old strategy. That's not where we are today. But the reason why they're not there today is because the Xbox brand has not been resonating. It has not been selling consoles. They have had to pivot into a subscription business and have a totally different business and everything. You know, like, let's not be crazy here. Um... And so, yeah, I don't know that that stuff's interesting, but like, that's not surprising, right? You, you know, that at the end of the day, they would love to fucking not have to deal with one another. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not, that's not shocking. Um, they would love to control more of the market. Same with Sony. Sony would love to control more of the market. That's why that, you know, when Jim Ryan's being asked about exclusives and, uh, and Bethesda games going exclusive to Xbox, he is very careful to say like, Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bummer, but like fundamentally, I don't have a problem with the idea of exclusives because if he says anything, they're going to go like, Oh, what about when you bought final fantasy 16? What about the, you know, what about all the games you have, uh, you have purchased, uh, for exclusive rights and so on and so forth, you know? Um, so he's being very careful to be like, Oh yeah, you know, they want to put Starfield out on you're like, sure. I, you know, I would love to have games like, but, but you know, Hey, um, yeah, no problem. No problem. No problem. Don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> Um, separately from this uh, the price of the Xbox Series X and the price of Xbox Game Pass is going up in many regions the console price will not be going up in uh, again this is according to The Verge will not be going up in the US, Japan uh, Chile, Brazil or Colombia and most other territories um the Xbox Series X price will be going up. Game Pass will be going up in price just about everywhere, including the U.S. Um, they have a quote here from Carrie Perez, head of communications for Xbox. Uh, this says, we've held on our prices for consoles for many years and have adjusted the prices to reflect the competitive conditions in each market. Um... So this is this is kind of pretty similar to the price increase that Sony did on the PlayStation 5 last year. Um, the new price for the Series X will be, what do we got here? 479 pounds in the UK, 549 euros in most European markets, 649 in Canada, 799 in Australia, all starting on August 1st. The Series S pricing will not be adjusted. Um... Game Pass pricing is going in the U.S. is going to go from fourteen ninety nine a month for Ultimate to sixteen ninety nine. Console pricing will go from nine ninety nine to ten ninety nine. PC Game Pass pricing is not changing, which says to me that they uh, need they want more people to sign up for PC Game Pass, and they can't afford to raise the price because people will not sign up. Um, And uh, let's see here. In some cases, the console, the Xbox Game Pass pricing will not be changing in Norway, Chile, Denmark, and Switzerland, and Saudi Arabia. But everywhere else, it's going up a buck or two or the, or the you know, the local equivalent. Um, this is, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons for this. Um factors outside of their control factors for the world economy and so on and so forth. But this still feels, this is just, this is unprecedented. And, and I felt the same way when the, they raised the price on the PlayStation five. Um, you know, normally we're talking about price cuts, you know, normally it's like, hey, do you think they're going to cut price this holiday? You think they'll they'll, they'll they cut price on the console for Christmas? Are they going to do this? And like the market has changed such that, you know, last generation, instead of seeing cheaper, slim consoles, 
uh, they went with, which, you know, eventually we did see some cheaper slim consoles, but they eventually went with pro consoles that they could use, that they could sell at either a higher price or to keep their price point up in the marketplace. And now we're just seeing ads, price raise. Sony, you know, I'm sure Microsoft has been in the same boat here, but like Sony has continued to um, update the motherboard. You know, they, they've continued to update the PlayStation 5 hardware in ways that make it cheaper for them to manufacture, I'm sure, and easier for them to manufacture. That's always the, the process that these consoles go through, that they see a lot of these board revisions and 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 everything else. But like, this feels fucking bad. Just from a like video game industry perspective and it's it's you know it's not necessarily something that is immediately tied to the gaming market it is something that they are looking at like theoretically worldwide economic conditions and 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 what it costs to build things and different bottlenecks in the manufacturing process i'm sure there are a lot of different things pulling on them when it comes to making these consoles um but it's yeah, like I said, none of this feels good. This this doesn't it doesn't feel good for the just the overall health of the business in some ways. Um and uh yeah, mostly because it's just like not happened. I mean, you know, granted the we also didn't go through a pandemic at the same time as a console launch and manufacturing has never been constrained the way it has been over the last have several years and so there's a lot of hand wavy excuses you could th- come up with, but bottom line they are raising the prices on this hardware that continues to age. Um, and that does not feel good. There were plenty of people who could not afford a console at the existing prices. And so coming out of this saying like, oh yeah, we're going to raise it. I don't know, 50 bucks, you know, like that's really fucking wild. Um, and I wonder if we'll see sales slow down or anything, or, or if they're just like, you know, if they're just now meeting demand and now they make them more expensive, maybe that I'm sure that they've run the numbers on this and projected and so on and so forth. And they're like, no, this is actually the best way for us to do this. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know. It doesn't feel good. It's a good point from, uh, Small rewarder on the Discord here says Microsoft has to be pleased to have the Xbox Series S on the market now. Yeah. I mean, they've got a lower price option. Sony doesn't even have that. So, you know, like, well, Sony has the discless unit, I suppose. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's weird. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> Not that price increases ever feel good, but I feel like the reasons they're getting out there with just don't just don't seem like ah what a healthy economic situation i I don't know the economic situation feels very weird across the board right because you've got like a bunch of people claiming that like the recession is right here it's it's happening right now it's happening right now and then like the jobs report comes out and you're like no it's not like you people are trying to stoke something here in the states uh at least for political reasons, not for reality reasons. And it just, I don't know. Feels bad. Speaking of reality, here's the new reality for boxed PC games from your friends at THQ Nordic. Um, they are going to have significantly limited print runs for physical copies of PC games for pretty much everything. And then they listed some of their upcoming products to say like, Hey, here's how many physical copies we're making for say jagged Alliance three. Um, and they've got this overly wordy, like, cause they're, they're like, okay, here's what we're doing with our print runs. Even, even standard editions will be highly limited. These print runs. And then they've got a list of bullet points are limited to a small amount of units are serially numbered and sealed will be premium packaged number one through number 10 or 25 or 50, who the fuck knows, are designated to our THQ Nordic Vienna store. 
Another batch will be made available online via THQ Nordic's online stores or offered to selected retail partners respectively. And the last number of the limited print run will always be sent to the Embracer Game Archives. Um, so, and, and they're looking to deliver data on how this is working out for them. Um, and so they've got a case study here for Jagged Alliance 3, the standard version. They made 2,500 units total. 1,500 units of the German version, serial numbers 1 through 1,500, and 1 through 20 are available from the THQ Nordic Vienna store. And that's a highlighted link in this article that they put up that is just an email address. Like, I'm going to email the store in Vienna to be like, hey, can you send me a copy? And they're going to be like, no, come to Vienna, dumbass. And I'm going to be like, no. <laughs> um, they sell the rest via the THQ Nordic online store, as well as selected German retail partners. 999 units of the international version are available via the online store, as well as selected retail partners. And number 2500 will be delivered to the Embracer Games Archive. And then they did a collector's edition. They only made 750 of those. And then they made a tactical Vienna store edition. They love this Vienna store. I just, you want it, you, hey, you want to buy physical video games? You better get to fucking moving. You better get to Vienna, motherfucker. You want physical copies of games? Vienna. They made 200 units in total of the Vienna Store Collector's Edition, 100 for the THQ Nordic Vienna Store, and 100 for the THQ Nordic Online Store, and 100 for promotion of the Fanta... That adds up to more than 200. Oh, no. 100 units for, for the Vienna Store and the Online Store total. And then 100 for, were for use for promotion and the Fantastic Games developer at Heimimont. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I've never had to say that word out loud before. Um, the, you know, the, again, I think the, the very idea that like PC games get boxed copies are really weird. It, it's just, it feels very quaint to me in a way when you, we talk about physical copies of PC games because of how, um, PC games work these days in terms of like coming out of launchers and, and, and all of this, you know. Is it going to be a disc that then also comes with a Steam key? Like, what are, what are we getting on those discs? And, and does it matter? And, you know, all of that stuff. Um, Alan Wake has been in the news for similar reasons, obviously. Because Alan Wake is a digital-only game. Eurogamer has an article that kind of backs up, uh, you know, what I heard from someone on the publishing side. Um... And the, the reason they're giving for why is it is digital only is because it gives them more time to polish the game up. Basically, you know, hey, the game's coming out October 17th. It's going to be digital only. And, uh, you know, in an interview with, um, I guess, Sam Lake, who is built as the creative director and the games director, Kyle Rowley, they basically say like, hey... Um, yeah, it's digital only and, and kind of coming to this idea, both from Remedy and Epic's perspective, that's our current thinking. It just felt it felt it made sense for this and the timing felt right. Uh, by going digital only, it does allow us more time to polish the game. Uh, it's uh, my understanding is about two months that they would not have. So basically, it means they just need to finish the game by October 16th <laughs> and and then let and then push it out the next day instead of having to go gold two months before release and then push it out then and then start working on patches and whatever else. Um, and people are very up in arms about this and I think that they're being a little short-sighted because I think if the demand is there, I'm there's going to be a run of physical copies of Alan Wake 2. If you really, really, really want a physical copy of Alan Wake 2, I bet that once all the dust has settled on this shit and the game is out the door, they've put out a couple of patches, whatever else, 
they will turn to limited run games or one of these other boutique manufacturers that runs off, you know, versions of games. They'll probably do some big collector's edition fucking steelbook thing. You know, with games out in October. So if they really tried to do it immediately, they could try to do it for December or whatever. Um, and that they could end up doing, you know, something either by the end of the year or early next year if they really wanted to do a physical copy of the game. And I think the reaction to this news is strong enough that they, I bet they will do exactly that. I don't know that for sure. But I feel like they will probably do some kind of collector's edition, special boxed copy, steel book ass version of Alan Wake 2. That if you want to get it that way, you can. Remember, this game is coming to consoles. Um, you know, I'm just, so I'm, I'm not sure they could do a PC version of the game, but you know, any PC version of that game is still going to be like, all right, uh, here's the game on disc if you want to install it that way, but also enter this key into the Epic client. Like, come on. Um, so, um, yeah, but I bet they end up doing console versions of the game, bare minimum, as some kind of limited run physical thing. Uh, it just, it makes sense, you know, and, and it, it, it kind of solves the... The, the stated problem that people have where they're like, oh, I, I'm not going to buy any physical, you know, I, I am only going to buy physical games because I like to own my games. And you're like, yeah, I, okay. Yeah. Um, sure. That that's valid. I don't, you know, I don't like that's, that's fine. And if you want that physical version, then you'll end up getting, you know, in, in, in by doing it this way, it's all just almost like, Hey, you'll get a copy of the game that is patched up and works as opposed to the day one version of the game where you're going to be like, oh, I hope the patch servers are still up. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, my, uh, this is going to just happen. This is all just going to happen. Um, and I suspect that we end up in a situation where all physical copies of games end up coming later and end up being, you know, this more limited run, uh, collectible in some ways where they, they're just like, yeah, you know, like game retail isn't really a valuable thing anymore. And so all of our games are going digital first. I, I just, I think that this is going to be across the board for the industry. Give it, give it five years. I don't know. Um, that, that I think that we'll, we'll end up in a situation where, where that's how physical games end up happening and that they only happen in these kind of limited runs. They only happen as, as, as this sort of, um, <clears throat> this kind of like after, after, not afterthought, but like as this kind of like wrapping it up, here's the, you know, Hey, it's, if it's a single player game, you're getting like this kind of patched version of the game on disc. So that's like a nice kind of side benefit. Um, from a preservationist standpoint, though, if you're truly preserving things, you would want all versions, the early broken version. You'd want to be able to try this version. That's like, this is the one for speed runs and this is that, but you know, I, I could, I, I could very much see, I, I bet that this will happen, that this will be how the industry goes digital only is that they will do it in a way where they continue to make physical games, but only do it after the fact and only do it as like a high ticket, like, the, you know, you might not even be in a situation where you see a standard edition $70 disc. It might be a case where they're only going to do like, hey, this is the fucking $250 crazy version that comes with a lady's torso or, you know, whatever the fuck they're packing in these things these days. The sweetest bag you've ever seen. Uh, but, you know, do a version, do a really nice version of Alan Wake. Pack in a fucking thermos some batteries uh you know pack in a copy of alan wake one do it as a box set you know there, there's a lot of different things you could do with a with a expensive copy of alan wake 2 that comes out outside of the purview of like oh my god we've got to finish a game you know once they get their feet under them and you know get past the ship date and and everything else you could probably make something pretty nice for people who want that you know um and uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. That's just a gut feeling thing that that that's how we have that's how this industry eventually does away with physical copies of games, or at least uh, does away with physical copies of games at launch. Um, is that they will launch digital only, and they will, you know, have these kind of limited runs after the fact, which will be bad for rental services. It'll be bad for people who like to sell used games because every copy of the game will be some weird collectible. Um, but it feels like that's the direction we've been slowly pushing in for a long time. And I, I bet that's what they do with Alan Wake is that they do, they do eventually ship something. Um, but it ends up being some kind of, you know, comes with an FBI jacket mal modeled after the FBI jacket that Saga wears comes with a working functional typewriter, you know, like some, you know, something like that, which I I don't need that in my life. Um, I don't, I, I still have, I, hmm, I still have a sealed collector's edition of Titanfall one, the big box with the big robot. Still got that out in my garage. Um, and I love that game, but I don't know that I really, I, have, I don't really currently have a place in my life to showcase a sick robot. Um, Maybe you do. Yeah. Um, multiverses is offline. The, <laughs> thank you uh, to all of the open beta participants for participating in the multiverses op open beta. It is offline as of uh, June 25th. They, uh, Video Games Chronicle also notes that the game was pulled from digital stores in April, which I forgot about, that they stopped selling it in April. Um, and so that is, uh, they're like, thank you for your support throughout our open beta. The feedback and inspiration has been amazing. On June 25th, we'll be closing the Multiverse's open beta as we prepare for our launch in early 2024. We plan to be back. I bet you do. We plan to be back and better than ever with new content, features, modes, and more when the game returns next year and we'll ensure that all of your progress and content will carry over. In the meantime, please please stay tuned for updates as we work towards the next phase of Multiverses. Um, and then they got out on Twitter and said, During our hiatus, all unlockable content will be temporarily available for your enjoyment. Once Multiverses returns for the game's launch in 2024, your account inventory will return to how it was prior to June 25th. Thanks. Thanks. So you can play it offline uh, with with all of the stuff unlocked. If you if you bought it or or bought access to it um, uh, at any point, this for as long as that game was out, I think to pull the rug and and you know this is a situation where this is probably the exact right move for the game, right? In terms of how many people were playing it, in terms of how Multiverses was finding its footing, in terms of the sorts of updates that Multiverses needed in order to maybe be a viable game, they are probably right that the only way for them to get it and to hopefully get it right is to literally shut the goddamn game down so that they can focus on that. Because if they have to focus on that, while also focusing on a regular cadence of updates to the live game, they're not going to have enough people to cover both. And so they're never going to refix. They're never going to fix the core of that game if they have to maintain the live game. So it's a bold thing they're doing. Bold strategy. Will it work? I, mm, mm, mm. I don't know. They made some choices over the course of that game's run that were hostile, where at some point they said, like, people are leveling up too fast. So we're going to make it take twice as much XP for you to level up uh, the, uh, the characters. You're like, oh, good. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Let's grind more. What a good idea. And then, you know, that's, yeah, they're not the only game to ever do that, but... You know, that was not a good way to solve user complaints. They did release some new characters and some other stuff, but it felt like that game, I, I that game was better than I thought it was going to be when it first came out. I was like, hey, this is all right. 
I I don't like platform fighters, but this is this seems kind of cool, huh? Um, it it felt like they were onto something in a way that I maybe didn't initially expect. Um, but over the course of the updates and and the 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 things they had to do to that game or the things they didn't do to that game, I suppose, um, it faded away really quickly, and I you know you you could see the player base really eroding for it. Uh, you know, just just people moved on. They did something else. You know, it didn't stick. And so at some point you're like, well, we're either going to shut it down completely in 18 months or what if we shut it down right now and actually try to salvage it? And so I'm kind of into that idea. It's crazy because people spent real money on this game and now they can't fucking play it. Um, and I think that's fucking wild, but you know, Hey, people spent money on this game and they weren't playing it already. So, Hey, um, what, what do you got to lose? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of a, a situation quite like this one. Like, yeah, you know, you look at like final fantasy 14 and the stuff they did there. Like that's a bold, crazy tactic. They, 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 it worked for them. It worked for them on final fantasy 14. You never would have expected it. Right. Um, but I think that tr the trajectory that multiverses was on, if they had left it up and running, no one cared. They were already at a point that no one was, no one cared about multiverses anymore. So this at least gives them, in theory, a second chance at trying to get this thing together, get it back on track, and um, and see if they can get it done. So in some ways, it's uh, I guess good on Warner Brothers, good on the publisher for actually maybe giving them this leeway. But then when you read the thing that says, we plan to be back and better than ever with new content. Like, you, uh, yeah, I bet, I bet you do. Um, it would not shock me if the game never returned. If we got another six months out and, and Warner brothers said like, we've, you know, Hey, we're, we're really good at pulling movies and TV shows down from our streaming service for, really weird tax reasons. What if we just fucking wrote off multiverses? What if we, what if we did that? And what if the whole thing just fucking goes away? Um, I would not find that shocking. In case you're looking for a check-in, the mania associated with me drinking this red line has subsided the uh the scary time is mostly over um i do still feel a little antsy but not not quite in the crazy way that i did um yeah so all the characters and cosmetics will be fully unlocked for people that have access to the game but um, yeah, uh, video games Chronicle notes that by February of 2023, the player count had dipped below 1000 on, uh, on steam, which was an erosion of 99.4% of its player base in less than seven months. Um, so yeah, yikes. Uh, E3, the future of E3, uh, continues to be up in the air. I think we all know, uh, where this is headed, but, uh, this is, well, I don't know. There's a, a, some documentation coming out of the Los Angeles city tourism board that includes a summary of planned conventions in the city. And it mentions that it includes E3 cancellations for 2024 and 2025. Um, and so this immediately led to everyone going, oh, E3's been canceled for 2024 and 2025. Um, which is, prob you know, hey, E3 was probably not going to happen in 2024 and probably not going to happen in 2025. But at the end of the day, all this really is, is the people that are responsible for the convention center 
saying they are not booking the convention center. And so all that means is that if, if they are going to run a physical event, they will not run it at the LACC. Um, and if they run an online event, then they don't need the LACC. So this is them kind of getting out of that contract or getting out of that uh, reservation process with the city. It doesn't necessarily mean that you won't see anything with E3 branding before 2026. Uh, I suspect, um, but we will see. I also would not be shocked if we never saw the word E3 ever again until Keeley bought it from the ESA and rebranded his show as E3. Um, which is not a bad idea. Once the sale price gets low enough. Well, but by the time the sale price gets low enough, perhaps the Summer Game Fest branding is strong enough that you wouldn't even want the E3 thing. I reminds me, you know, we had an opportunity. The, um, the guy that was the, you know, the head of Whiskey Media back in the day came to me. This is the Sausalito days. He came to me and he said, Hey, should we buy EGM? Uh, I've been, someone reached out to me and asked if we wanted to buy EGM. And I was like, what do we, for what? <laughs> uh, my, my first reaction was like, fuck yeah, let's fucking buy EGM. Let's be EGM. That'd be hilarious. Um, but then I thought about it. I said like, well, what do we get? Um, what do we actually, what do we actually get for that? Do we, because I was thinking about like, what the fuck would we do with it? EGM stands for Electronic Gaming Monthly. We're a website. The EGM brand is stupid in this day and age. Um, <clears throat> and so, so it, it boiled down to a couple of really dumb things of like, well, I guess we could take turns calling each other Sushi X and that'd be really fucking funny. Um... And we could scan the issues and put them online and put them in the wiki or something like that and uh, and have that be that. But like, you know, we weren't going to go start another print magazine as funny as that would have been. Um, and so, you know, I, I looked at it for a while and we, we had a couple of conversations just internally of just like, what would we do with this? Is this something? And, and I after thinking about it for a couple of days, I was pretty down on it. I was just like, yeah, this would be funny. But like, unless they're, you know, unless they're selling it for a song, unless it's like $9, like there's nothing there of, because those scans of those magazines are already online everywhere. So it's not like, you know, what are we going to hire lawyers? To be like, Shut down your scanning operations. We have the official scans of EGM, you know, like it's not, um, you know, it, it's, it's whatever. So, yeah, other than, and, and you know, you're going to rebrand it so that the M stands for something else or what, you know, I don't, like, no, I, yeah, I, like, if they had continued to somehow hold the nuke.com domain, I probably would have fucking been like, yes, we need it. Um, but, and, and then it ended up, I, you know, what Steve Harris ended up getting it back, right? And they started a thing and they were in Wal, they ran the Walmart magazine or something. Yeah, EGM Now. EGM now. Yeah. So it ended up coming back in some way, shape or form following that conversation. Like someone did end up buying it and doing something with it, but it just, this, the, the brand seemed so pointless to me though. Over the years I did see a lot of, yeah. When, when, when they did bring EGM back, there were a lot of people that thought it was the same thing. There were a lot of like casual folks that were just like, oh, EG yeah, no, this is EGM. I used to read EGM back in the day. And you're like, that's not EGM. Like the thing, the website you're looking at is not attached at all to the fucking magazine that you maybe liked in the nineties. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It just, yeah. But anyway, Keely should buy the E3 brand, I think. Um, and uh, anyway, so I guess like the, the, the statement issued to Video Games Chronicle here, the ESA claims that no final decisions have been made about next year's potential event. ESA is currently having conversations about E3 2024 and beyond, and no final decisions about the event have been made at this time. Um, which I think is probably accurate because I, I, but, cause I do think that no matter what they do, if they did manage to bring... 
E3 back, it would not be as uh, a physical show at the LA Convention Center. They're not going to, they're not, a year is not enough time for them to put that show together and convince publishers that it needs to happen and so on and so forth. There's no, there, there's nothing there. So if they do do it, they would get a smaller venue um, and, and not have it in the convention center. So I think the only thing we know for sure is that they don't have a hold on the convention center for 2024 or 2025. So not, not surprising, I suppose. Um, speaking of game shutdowns, the original call of duty war zone is going to be taken offline in September. Uh, September 21st, to be exact. At some point, they renamed this thing to Call of Duty Warzone Caldera because apparently that's the name of the map in the first Warzone. I would not have... I would not have been able to pull that out of a hat. Or pull that out of my head, I suppose. Um, this is unfortunate for people who bought skins um, for that game. <laughs> uh... My Bruce Willis skin is going to be less useful after September. It'll still be usable in the whatever competitive multiplayer for those for for Black Ops Cold War and you know uh, and whatever those games were for Modern Warfare One and Black Ops Cold War. Those skins came in, uh, and yeah, so so you'll still be able to use them in their in in Vanguard and Black Ops. Can I? Can I go back and play Warzone 1 as Snoop Dogg? I should go check. Um, yeah, so if you want to get any Warzone 1 in, uh, they're shutting it down. But, uh, you know, it sounds like that when they do do uh, Call of Duty Mobile all over again, and that they may have that map back in there. So if you want to do Caldera, maybe you'll have an opportunity to do it there. I don't know. Um, it's a bummer. I don't know. I Like, I get it. Like, they have another Warzone out, and, you know... Much like Madden, you shut down the servers for the old one to uh, get people to play the new one. So, sure. But. Let's get into some emails. <clears throat> Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. You can send in your email to me. And if I'm feeling appropriately fucking cracked out on energy drinks... I'll read them all in 30 seconds or less. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, I'm, 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 I'm definitely, I feel like I'm coming down already uh, from the, so I guess that means I should drink the other half, right? 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 <laughs> um, uh, we got this email in here uh, from the Stitcher team. Important message. Stitcher will discontinue services effective August 29th, 2023. We have decided to discontinue operation of the Stitcher app and website. This includes our Stitcher premium service. We also encourage you to add your podcast to Creator Connect, a part of Sirius XM, which will help you... What? what? Uh... I don't know the, the yeah Stitcher Premium was where uh some of the Earwolf shows were appearing for a while because Stitcher Stitcher has been through a lot of acquisitions and stuff not to just talk like podcast business for a while but um but yeah they ended up Stitcher and and Midroll which was our ad network for a number of years and also there was the ad network started by Earwolf the company that ran Comedy Bang Bang and um and everything else stitcher had a and i think they cleaned it up eventually stitcher had a fucking garbage reputation for a good long time because what stitcher was doing when they were hosting other people's podcasts is they would just pull the file once and then when you went to the stitcher site or whatever to listen to a podcast it came from their servers and not yours and so the podcast business is all about how many people downloaded your show. So Stitcher was effectively robbing you of fucking downloads. And I want to say that they may have been stitching other advertisements into those podcasts uh, as well. 
Yes, Pat is yes, they did they did that. They put in their own fucking ads on top of that. Garbage. Scumbag behavior. True fucking scumbag behavior. And so they went through and they, they were like, oh, what is that a problem? Oh, we're so sorry. You know, and they eventually I think did try to clean up their act and then they got acquired a bunch of times and then it just became another generic podcast directory, which the world doesn't need any of those. No one fucking uses, you know, it's like I all of all of the listens to this show, as far as I can tell, come out of the Apple podcast stuff. Um or the or Spotify. Uh I think Spotify is number two. And uh you know, Google Podcasts occasionally. Um but yeah, some people just use direct RSS and import that into a, uh, into a, 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 something like a pocket casts or, um, or whatever else. Yes. Oh God. Pat. Yes. Pat in the chat, uh, says you would then get, so you had to like force stitcher to remove your show from their fucking bullshit thing. And then you would get emails going like, I used to listen to your show, but could you, could you please add it to stitcher? And I, I, one out of every five of those, I didn't get a lot of them uh, over the years, but you would just respond to be like, no, <laughs> and here's why. And so a lot of podcast uh, people were very up in arms about what Stitcher was doing and called them out very publicly and very like, yo, fuck you guys. They were just, it was straight up scum, scum stuff. Um. Anyway. <laughs> what does this mean for my listeners so okay if, if you're if you happen to be listening to this show on stitcher which i maybe you can do i don't know as of august 29th this app may be opened but listeners will no longer be able to access their show lists downloads preferences or listening history so yeah if you use stitcher if you use stitcher don't but i would have said that all along uh, if you are still using Stitcher somehow, you need to stop. So, uh, know that, I suppose. Um, let's see. Uh, let's look at some more of these emails. Jeff from Queens writes in and says, Data miners for the upcoming AEW Fight Forever have uncovered screenshots for a stadium stampede battle royale mode that includes weapons, vehicles, and even a skate park tucked inside a massive football stadium. Even if Rumbleverse is long gone, it seems the spirit will live on through AEW Fight Forever. Um, I suppose I'm relatively limited on what I can say about AEW Fight Forever on account of the review embargo that is in place. Um, but there is, I guess, a, a THQ community manager here saying like, Hey, hey guys, take it with a grain of salt. It's just a rumor. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what this screenshot actually is of. Um, is this really it? No. Okay. So this is not actually a THQ community manager. It's just like people posting screenshots. I don't. <sighs> so I'll say this, I guess. I have no idea what this is referring to. In terms of a mode in a game or, or whatever. Um, maybe this would be something they would patch in later. I, I'm trying to stay within the realm of like, I have played a lot of this game and I cannot review this game and I'm looking at these screenshots and I have no idea what any of this is. Take that how you will. It sounds like an intriguing idea. I don't know. It sounds like something that was data mined out of the game, which I don't understand how people are data mining the game. If the game is not out yet, but maybe people got a hold of, because they're not even taking pre-orders on Steam. Last I looked. That is how shoddy the run-up to release for AEW Fight Forever is. 
is that they're not even doing pre-orders on Steam yet. It feels like they just suddenly over the last two weeks decided like, let's put out some videos of this game we have coming out. Almost as if they had to resolve a bunch of legal shit with one of the main talents in the game or something before they felt they could promote it. I don't know. It's been a very weird... We spent some time talking about that on the the pseudo podcast that Glenn and I did that uh, you'll be able to listen to, I suppose, tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll say, I you know, I have never heard of this. Also, I think, you know, Rumbleverse, you know, the, the, the concept here that Jeff writes in, even if Rumbleverse is long gone, it seems the spirit will live on through AEW fight forever. No. Um, Rumbleverse is, you know, it's wrestling adjacent in a ways. I mean, you know, the, the mechanics of that game are, um, not necessarily like it, it plays really well. Um, it, it does a lot of stuff. I hope Rumbleverse returns in some form. Um, and I, I don't know what to make of this is this is some DLC. Th- I, I have no, I, I don't know. Um, Derek from Mesa, Arizona writes in and says, I thought the first uh, asking about series that got worse and worse with each game. Now, if, if they wanted to do something cool, what they should do is the AEW people should go to the Rumbleverse people and say, Hey, could you make us an AEW themed battle Royale game? It doesn't have to play like our existing game. That would be cool. They should do that. Anyway. Um, Derek Rice says, I thought the first fear was amazing, but I think it's a bummer. The rest of the games that followed in the franchise only got worse and worse. Are there any other franchises, good or bad, that you believe declined in quality with each follow-up? Huh. Worse and worse with each follow-up. I, um... Dead Rising is an interesting choice. Spring Break My Heart says Dead Rising. I, I'd like Dead Rising 2, I think. Um... I think I might like Dead Rising 2 more than Dead Rising 1, but it's... I, I see why. Um... I might say Siphon Filter... Oh, Soul Calibur is a great one. Psychos is Soul Calibur. And it's not... I, I think Soul Calibur 1 is an incredible video game and I haven't cared about anyone that's come out since. Uh, do you count Soul Edge? I think if you count Soul Edge, that's a different story because I think Soul Calibur is the peak of that franchise <laughs> if we were counting Soul Edge um, as one of those games. Um Siphon filter, I might say, is a uh, is a choice there. Though I maybe siphon filter two was better than one. Yeah, crackdown is a good one. Crackdown is a perfect example. Crackdown one good. Crackdown two disappointing. Crackdown three. What the fuck are we even doing? Yeah. Um. I was going to say, you know, like, I don't think it holds true anymore, but I think I've, I think I felt this way about the early days of Ratchet and Clank, where it was a feeling of like Ratchet and Clank came out and it was very fresh and new. And then when the second one came out, it felt like they were like, well, we made the menus in this one red instead of blue and there's different guns and levels, but it's kind of the, and so I, I remember at the time being like, eh. But, but I think they, they obviously, you know, that's been a long running franchise. I think the most recent Ratchet and Clank game is actually the, maybe the best one in the whole, well, I don't know. That first one was so like, I don't know, borderline revolutionary. Um, but there's a mid period for Ratchet and Clank that I just didn't really give a fuck about. Um, you know, those PS, that PS3 games or you know, whatever. Um. But man, that most recent Ratchet and Clank is a fucking killer. Um, yeah, Crackdown's a good a good choice there. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog is a funny one. Um, except Sonic Frontiers bucks the trend because it's the best one since the first one. 
Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, Tony Hawk fell off after Tony Hawk 3 for sure. But I mean, if we're thinking about like just like games where the first one was the best one. Yeah, Dota. Dota 1 was really where it was at. Dota 2 is where they fucked it all up. Border. Eh, bo shot point says Borderlands. Yeah, kind of. Borderlands 2 is kind of a sweet spot, though. But, uh, but Borderlands 2, the I think the characters are worse. I think the the character classes in Borderlands 1 are better. But like there's a lot more game flow stuff that I think is better in Borderlands 2, but Borderlands 2, the writing started to get shitty. But yeah, Borderlands 2 is a better game. It's just a, it's just a yes, quality of life updates for sure. They they did a lot of that stuff. Um Donkey Kong? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Donkey Kong 3 is pretty good. I don't know. Eh, it's not better than the first one, though. Donkey Kong Jr. is really a great game, and no one's talking. No one is talking about Donkey Kong Jr. anymore. It's a sad state of affairs. Um, um, Harvey Forrest writes in and says, uh, we're just about one month separated from launch. How are you feeling about Street Fighter 6's modern control scheme? Are you using it? Do you feel like you're at any advantage or disadvantage in online play versus someone using a different control scheme from yourself? I, um, I have not been using it. I, I find it really hard to... I, I have too many decades invested in how you play Street Fighter um, to switch. And so, uh, you know, obviously, if I put the time in, you could adjust and, and whatever. But, like, I, um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to do that. I, I'm not having trouble with the classic controls, and I think I just prefer them because it's what I'm familiar with, right? So, um, I think in terms of the balance they've done around damage and, and, and how the, you know, the, the moves that you have at your disposal... Um, it's not for me. I think it's fine though. Um, I, okay. I, people in chat are saying that some pro players used it for a while. Sounds like Tokido stopped using it. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah I'd, I'd be interested to see if any pro players actually make the switch. Cause that'd be weird. Um, and it'd be interesting to see like what they do with it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not having trouble with the controls in Street Fighter, but also I'm not trying to pull off the crazy combos that require it, um, that require like really good timing and really good execution and, and, and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so yeah, I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's interesting that it exists. It doesn't feel like it's broken. Yeah, Bryn says that pros were mostly using it so they could have one frame supers allowing you to like counter grab supers with Luke's level three, which is really funny. Um, um, yeah, that is kind of that, that does sound filthy, but you know, if you have to do it at a damage at disadvantage and, and whatever else, then, then that's gonna, you know, that's gonna have its downsides. So, but that's interesting, you know, that it really opens up some tech that would be extremely difficult to do, but I, yeah, I don't know. It feels like something that really is there for new players. And, um, I have encountered players using modern controls online um, somewhat frequently, I guess. So people are using it, but I have not had trouble with them, generally speaking, at the levels I'm at where, you know, uh, Harris here says that he's uh, he's at Silver 2 with Honda. That's probably about that's similar to where I'm at, I think. Um, and, uh, and I have not encountered people that are using modern controls that are like crazy good or, or, or whatever else. But, um, it seems fine that it's in there. I think that people that need it or people that, that want it are, are having a good time with it as far as I can tell, or they're, you know, it's, it's maybe getting them into the game in a way that they wouldn't be otherwise because they're playing multiplayer, you know, like normally those players would be like, well, I'm just, I don't understand how to play. So I'm not even going to try playing online. I think by virtue of me seeing a lot of modern control players online, it seems to be doing what they hoped it would do. Um, so 
if it's bringing more people to the game, especially more people at varied skill levels, like that's what we need, right? Is over time, eventually all the players become totally ruthless and every game you get into online is not fun anymore. If modern controls are helping keep lower skill players around longer, that's going to be better for everyone who plays that game. So, yeah, I, I think it's cool that it's there. It feels like they found a way to make it work. Maybe someone will find something totally broken with it and that'll, you know, that'll be a, a problem. But and it, so far, it doesn't really seem like an issue. Jay from Cupertino writes in and says, with the talk about the successor to the Switch picking up again, it got me thinking. What about the features? Uh, it got me thinking about what features the console might have. Since the DS, it seems like every Nintendo console or handheld has had some feature that differentiated it from other companies' offerings and made it more than just a more powerful version of the previous generation's hardware. Do you have any theories on what sort of features Nintendo might include on their next console? Do you think Nintendo views having some unique new feature as a must-have for a new device, or could their next device basically be a more powerful version of the Switch? Um... I could see it going either way. Um, I think that the Switch is interesting enough um, that they could stick with this exact form factor and this exact concept and do it again with a more powerful device, and I think that that would be enough. Um, but in terms of theories about features that they could include, I think, again, you have to think back to what do we think of as Nintendo's core focus? And when Nintendo thinks about what they want to do next, what lens do they view it through? And that lens is usually families. That, that lens is usually, how do we make this more family friendly? How do we make this something that more people can enjoy socially? Um, and so I wonder if, you know, okay, here's something they could do while still maintaining the form factor and still, you know, basically issuing the same console. They could be friendlier about what the dock can do. Envision a scenario, if you will, uh, where they can basically use the next switch and the dock and multiple switches to effectively recreate that um, Pac-Man versus thing. Basically what the Amico was promising to do in a sixth sense of like, what if the television could display something different than what was on the tablet? Like a Wii U, for example. Now, what if you had four switches and everyone had their own switch and used it as a controller for calling plays in a football game? Or, you know, the, the standard things we talk about when we talk about everyone having their own private screen. You know, you could build a Mario Party game around those concepts because everyone's got their own secret thing. Card games would be much more doable in a local multiplayer setting if everyone had their own screen. Um, and so I think if you end up thinking about what the Switch doesn't do easily, it's that couch co-op stuff because you have to go out and buy all the controllers and buy everything else. Not that having four Switches in the household is cheap or easy to do, but you could envision a scenario where they say, oh, okay, you can do this and do this multiplayer game this way. And maybe you put some power in the dock, some processing power in the dock uh, that allows it to run whatever the TV thing is of like, hey, the game show is happening up here, but you're buzzing in down here or, or whatever, right? Um, and you could achieve that through having a lead console, a lead switch that also acts as a streaming thing to the dock. Um, or you could put some genuine firepower in the dock itself, uh, that would let it kind of run games in that scenario. You could even have a situation where, what if you didn't have to have four copies of a game? And so, you know, you're almost tweet treating the switches as dumb terminals. And once you're doing that, once you're doing that, you could potentially update the old switch in a way that helps it act like a controller for the new switch. 
I'm just fucking shooting, you know, I'm just fucking shooting the shit over here. I'm not, this isn't, you know, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. But like, if it was a streaming scenario where the doc was powerful enough to stream video signal or stream content that would ran locally on the switch or something what if you ended up in a scenario where those those could be used as controllers um in in this particular scenario you know so you have like the main screen showing you the full track of mario here's the big uh, uh spectator mode view of mario kart but everyone is down here playing that way you know and they're or they're or they're looking up to see like uh, I'm trying to think what would be a gameplay thing that would make that relevant. What if you had a scenario where like you're largely playing here but occasionally up on the TV they're saying like hey there's a hazard on the course ahead and they're showing you a track view and saying like hey fucking bloobers came all over this spot on the track you really gotta look out. Um, and so you know th there's like different stuff they could do there um, that makes both screens matter. So I could almost see them getting back to a scenario where it kind of makes good on some of the concepts of the Wii U. It kind of makes good on some of those concepts of Game Boys plugging into the GameCube and some of those different things. Like I think that that's something that if you brought all of those concepts together over the last 10, 15 years, whatever it is, 10, 20 years, GameCube, Jesus. Um, and, and bring all that together. I think that that's sort of a scenario where you could, you could do some really interesting things with local multiplayer gaming in, in that world. Um, and still have a device that you take on the go and still plays, you know, like the single player stuff is all still largely limited to a single screen. But you have these, you know, these these co-op or these multiplayer experiences that are dual screen experiences, if you so choose, because you can have the extra kind of communal screen providing tactical updates or whatever the fuck, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. That's something you could do. I don't know that that's enough that you could hang an entire console on it. Um... But I don't know that we'll see something that is like a major, major, major departure from what they're doing. Um, because I think the expectation is that they would hope, you know, that this would be backwards compatible. And, you know, so you would, you would need a form factor that is at least somewhat similar to the existing switch or, or something. But, um, yeah, I don't know that that's, uh, put that down as my guess. I don't know. I, I don't know what you would do, but that's. I feel like that's something you could do that would not be uh, totally out of character for them. <sighs> Marcus writes in and says, the PS5 is ass, actually. I'll get right to it. No System Wars bullshit here. I don't own an Xbox Series S or X, so my main comparison point is to the PlayStation 4 and Switch. I've had a PS5 for about six months now, and outside of the game library, goddamn, am I underwhelmed with the overall console experience. Can we run down the list of what was sold to us by Sony when the PS5 was announced? I know you've already covered the fact that few third-party teams prioritize the zero load times, but what about how faulty the quick resume function is? I can't tell you how many times I rested the system, turned it back on, and my single-player game has been reset due, due, due to a non-essential patch update. But on the flip side, I come back to Modern Warfare 2 after not touching it for a couple of weeks, and I have to sit and wait for an update to install. I've also had issues with Bluetooth accessories not playing friendly with the console, but pairing with no issue to my Switch, of all things. Also, I know there were stories of how the UI was thrown together last minute to get the console out the door, but it's been three years and the whole page still looks like complete dog shit. Am I alone on this? Ah, you're... Well, hey, listen. Um, Marcus, you're not wrong. Um, I just don't know that that stuff ends up being that big of a deal. And I think a lot of these things are things I would throw at other platforms as well. Um, I don't like the PS5 UI. I'm with you. It's, it's not, it's not good. The, the quick resume stuff on Xbox and, and the similar equivalent on PlayStation 5. I had enough problems with that early on that I just don't trust it. 
I, I, I save my games and close them down and, and start them back up. And you know, like I don't, um, I don't trust any of that stuff because it's been shitty. Um, I think the no load time thing is, is extremely frustrating because of how cool that is when you see it. When you play Ratchet and Clank, I'm really curious to see Ratchet and Clank on PC and what they end up doing there. I want to do two things with that Ratchet and Clank game. One, I want to install it on my C drive and see what happens because that's the direct storage drive. And then two, I want to install it on the slowest hard drive in my system, which I think is a 7200 RPM drive. And I want to see what that does. Um, I have to know. Um, but yeah, the, the load time stuff. Hey, at the end of the day, you give game developers any sort of power, any sort of um, processing power, any sort of like, hey, you can hold more assets here. Here's more memory for this. They're going to fill it up as quickly as they possibly can and run into the same sorts of limitations that you've seen for decades <laughs> across generations when it comes to load time and when you give them more RAM, they'll fill it up. And they won't use it for stuff like, Oh, what if it just didn't load? You know, they'll fill it up. You give them a more powerful piece of hardware that can run more games at 60 frames a second. They will find a way to put more shit on the screen and say, ah, this can only run at 30. Um, time and time again. So I, you know, uh, if you're having that bad of a time with the PlayStation five, I would say sell it, um, and, and move on to something else. Um, but I don't know. I, you know, I think as a console, it's fine. I both, I think both consoles are fine for what they are. I don't use them all that much because I, I went and invested in PC stuff. Um, and so I have this like situation where I would love to spend more time using my consoles, but since almost all of the games come out on PC, it's really just first party Sony stuff that I, you know, have to like, that's the only thing that I'm like, oh, I absolutely positively must turn on my PlayStation five to play this game. Um, you know, for convenience and for just like, Hey, I made the investment in a more powerful machine. And so I might as well play the games there. Didn't work out so good for Jedi survivor, but you know, Hey, fucking shit happens sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's it. I, there's definitely like, I, I you know, I, I think part of that, part of me investing in that hardware for PC is, is certainly to blame here. Um, and so I try to remember like, Hey man, these things are, you know, not nearly as expensive as this fucking graphics card, let alone the rest of this PC, um, for the price, even at these raised prices that they're giving you, uh, which it doesn't, it does not feel good. I think for, you know, in that $500 range, that $600 range, what you're getting is powerful. You know, what, what you're, you know, and the interface isn't great. And you know, there's, there's weird stuff around the edges, but in terms of how well it plays games, it does that. It does it fine. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it comes down to a matter of preference and budget at some point. All, all of this stuff does. But I do think that like the differences between the Xbox series X and the PlayStation five are so fucking minimal. You know, it's not to say that there are zero differences between them, but like, it just, it doesn't matter. The Xbox is totally fine. Again, unless you're looking to play first party Sony things, you know? And so it creates this scenario where like me personally, I don't have a lot of good reasons to turn on an Xbox series X because they have made the commitment to bring all of those games over to PC. And so I can play those games in better ways over here than I can over there. And, uh, and that's cool. I like it. <laughs> I, I like playing Forza on a PC and being able to throw much more power at it than an Xbox series X has and being able to hit higher resolutions and frame rates and so on and so forth, you know, and, and 
you know, I wish that they would have ported over the backwards compatibility. That specific Xbox stuff would have been really nice. Um, if I could do that on PC. Well, I suppose I can play Xbox and Xbox 360 games on a PC just fine as well these days. That's getting better all the time. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, e Ian writes in and says... Uh, I have been reading Game Informers from the early 2000s as, and was reminded of the existence of the N-Gage. What is the emulation scene for this little phone slash gaming device like? It was the shits for years. Uh, there was something that would kind of emulate N-Gage games but didn't do it well and um, was all sorts of fucked up. But relatively recently, I'm going to say within the last 12 months, a new emulator has hit the scene. It doesn't just do N-Gage stuff. It's like, um, it's it, that, that version of the Symbian OS or, or whatever it is. Um, and the emulator is called, yeah, this is a, it's called EKA2L1. And it is a Symbian OS slash N-Gage emulator. Um, and looking at it, it, you know, it seems to run this stuff quite well. Uh, according to their GitHub page, it says the emulator supports almost all official N-Gage official libraries. Most of the Symbian game libraries from the, the Series 60 V1 up to the Symbian Bell and a limited subset of Symbian applications. And they have a compatibility list and stuff for, for games that run on it. I fired it up a long time ago and was playing like... There was a King of Fighters game for the N-Gage and I happened to have that and played it uh, a little bit of it and uh, it worked. Emulating the N-Gage is weird because it had a full phone keypad and so there, in theory there are games that could have a lot of buttons and so playing it on a controller might suck. It might be a scenario where you like end up using both halves of a keyboard to do it which is weird but uh, you know you could, you could do it. Hasn't been seeing a ton of updates from the looks of things, but there was an update three weeks ago. Or I guess they've just, they have a latest source. Um, it looks like it updated three weeks ago, but I'm not seeing a ton of updates to the source code here in there. Oh, that's just the compatibility list. Sorry. Yes, they've been, they have been updating it here and there. It has seen some updates this very month. Um, and there's a build for Android as well, which is funny, but, uh, yeah, you can, you can pretty much emulate end gauge games these days. I don't know how compatible it is with every single end gauge game, but yes, you can do it. Um, it's been a while since I checked in on that. I should probably, uh, I should probably fire that back up. Uh, Ashley writes in, I'm gonna make this our last email. Uh, with a question about how analytics are used in gaming today, I was thinking about how everything is online now and a publisher might track anything a player does down to a button press. Do you have any insight on data collection in games and how it is being used? Example, holding the button to get through the menus in games nowadays feels like a data-driven change in the industry. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, you know, uh, they, they let you opt out of data collection in a lot of cases. You know, at least EA does. I think they were the one of the first to start popping that up and saying like, Hey, we would love, we would love to do some stuff. Um, the button press is probably not something they're collecting from, uh, you know, in, in a data from the end user. That's probably something that they're doing UX studies and, and, and seeing players doing things incorrectly. You know, like, Oh, this should be a hold rather than a press to make sure that we, that they aren't hitting it by mistake. And, you know, we want to make sure that the intent is this before they do this data collection is probably going to be more about how long you spend playing a game, how far you get into a game. Um, some of the choices you might make in a game. Um, this stuff used to not exist. This type of, of data collection didn't exist in games for a long time. We had someone back when we were tracking achievements and we had a pretty good pool of achievement data that we had scraped out of PSN and out of Xbox live. And we had, um, you know, a lot of like, Hey, we, we had a lot of situations where we knew what percentage of our user base 
had gotten this achievement, but not this achievement. And there, are, you know, depending on how the achievements in a game are built, you can start to make inferences about that. And that's something that now the current consoles actually have percentages built into the dashboard and steam does this as well, though sometimes their percentages seem a little screwy. Um, where you can see what percentage of the total player base got any one of those achievements. And that determines if it's rare or if it's common or, you know, whatever it is. And so you can go and look and say, like, this is the achievement or trophy that you get when you finish the campaign. What percentage of players finished the campaign? And you can look at it and get depressed because you look at it and go like, 17% of players finished my game. 80% of players finished chapter one. What is that other 20% doing that they didn't even finish chapter one? Um, and so we had someone from Bioware get in touch years ago, years, years, years ago, um, before games were collecting a lot of this data and before the platform holders were sharing those metrics, uh, with publishers in a very easy to process way. I think they got better with that not long after this, but we had someone at Bioware go like, Hey, um, we're trying to figure out analytics stuff. Like we would love to fucking be able to use this data or have a, a way to, and, 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 you know, I think our response was just like, well, it's on the website. I mean, you know, if you want to look at it, look at it all day long, I mean, if you want to feed of it, why, well, you know, we can figure that out or, you know, and talk about that. But I, I never got to that point. We had a couple of loose conversations about it and that was that. Um, and, so it was a desire on the game developers part to have access to that data that they weren't getting from platform holders at the time. And I think they've since made the request enough times to the platform holders that that stuff is provided in a more real time or closer to real time format. Um, or you can just go turn on a PlayStation and look at the dashboard yourself and go like, oh, okay, here's the percentages. Um, <clears throat> and so I bet that some amount of achievement design is done with those analytics in mind. Where when they're designing the trophies in a game, they're like, okay, well, we, we would love to know how many people do this and how many people don't do this and how many people do this 50 times and so on and so forth. Um, that's for, you know, largely for single player games. That's largely for offline video games. In online games, I'm sure they are tracking way more analytics because all of that data just comes into them because it's happening on their servers to begin with. And because they're like, well, whatever we're, we're parsing all of this data for like anti cheat reasons anyway. And so as a result, here's a heat map of, and, and you know, I'm sure so much weapon balance in call of duty or other shooters is done based on that data because they can look at it and go like, Hey, there's a shotgun like we, we have a pretty knowable curve as to how we think the weapon balance is. And we're seeing a spike here on usage of this shotgun and kills this shotgun is getting. And every, you know, like the distance at which those kills are registering seems a little out of whack. And so they are probably, they probably have some kind of dashboard. I would bet a world-class I, I, yeah, I, I would bet whether it's Diablo for drop rates or, you know, Call of Duty kills with different weapons at different ranges and and whatever else. They probably have some form of daily dashboard or real time data that they can look at and see like, hey, this chart looks fucking weird. Let's dig into that gun. What's happening right now? Why is this gun being chosen? And sometimes I bet guns get picked more frequently because of community perception as opposed to actual reality. I'm sure when, you know, it felt like there was a new meta gun in the war zone every week. And depending on which YouTube channel you're subscribed to, you're going to move from gun to gun to gun the same way, you know, people go watch the international and then suddenly try to play Dota a very specific way in the weeks following, right? They go, they see that tech and they go, Oh, I can do that fighting games. Same way. Um, where like, you know, hey, some low tier character wins at Evo, suddenly character selection of that, of that character is going to fucking spike. Um, and so some of that is just like natural. You're going to see natural ebbs and flows and spikes over the course of your game. I bet. Now this is again, this is me guessing. I've never made a game, but I have to imagine that. And you, you I have to imagine that the data processing tools are this robust. Maybe they're not, but I would assume 
as someone who used to have a television near him that was showing real time stats on website traffic and all this other horse shit that I didn't need. And so I stole that raspberry Pi out from behind that TV and I have it here somewhere now. Um, but there were other TVs around the floor that people could look at and go like, Oh, the traffic spike is this and all oh, the server response time is this. And it was like useless shit for me. But, you know, for an engineer that needs to know if, like, hey, query times, you know, are fucking spiking, something's broken, if they can look at it and go, like, that seems out of whack, like, that's useful for them. Um, I would assume that game developers of a major online video game like Call of Duty have something similar, right? Not necessarily TVs around the office that let them know that a gun is too powerful, but... I'm sure that there are people in the, you know, design team, whatever, you know, whatever team needs that data probably has access to some dashboard where they can look like how many people were killed with the fucking FTAC siege yesterday and how many of those kills were beyond our kind of envisioned range for this weapon. And if they can look at that number and go, that shit is fucking way too high, then they know that that weapon is getting too many kills at too long of a range. And then they can look at it and go like, we expect it to be way closer to this. And so we need to fucking reduce the effective range of this weapon. We need to tweak this or they can tweak other weapons to match it and bring it all up. Or, you know, fighting games, I think are more fun when you don't nerf characters, you bring everyone else up. That is, uh, I think that fighting game balance is way more exciting where instead you give all of the other characters new tools to deal with that shit as opposed to taking that and going like, you're having too much fun and we've got to pull this back. It's, you can't always do that, but that's it's fun. Every, every character should feel broken. Every main, every, you, every character you play, you should come away from it going like, yeah, I'm fucking those guys up because my character's so good and I'm so good at it. Like, you should feel like you're getting one over on other players, you know? Um, but with every character in the game, I think that's a good feeling, you know, when you feel like you're getting one over on somebody. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the multiplayer games or server driven games like a Diablo, you know, Blizzard knew exactly when, because they have their unique items in the game where they're like, we've got six unique items that are incredibly hard to fucking drop and they drop at 880 power or whatever it is. Um, they knew that you know, the, 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 when one of those had dropped and, and a player said, hey, look at this thing, I found it. They were able to go like, yeah, that's a real one. That's not, someone's not faking a screenshot. Like that's, yep, yep, that's us. Um, we didn't think anyone would find it that quickly, but there it is. Um... And so I, I have to envision that there's a lot, a ton of queries they can run or, or get served to them in a, in a daily dash. I would love to be able to look at that info. I think that'd be fun just to see like the, the daily heat maps for call of duty or something where you just like see a weapon get fucking crazy after a patch, you come back the following morning, get your cup of coffee, go, ah, all right, what are we looking at? And it's just, in, you know, there's just a red blinking screen that says gun fucked, unfuck the gun. And you're like, uh oh, we got to unfuck this gun. And they're like, well, let's spend another week not unfucking the gun because, well, people should buy. It'd be nice if people spent a bunch of COD points buying this blueprint uh, before we go and unfuck the gun. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the, that's the Dota. That's the, the, like or the the League of Legends model, right? Like new character is broken, so everyone buys new character, and then we nerf new character, and then now there's another new character, and this new character is broken. You should buy the new character. I, I doubt they're actually doing this on purpose, but that's definitely the perception sometimes. Um, I find all that stuff fascinating. I, I've never really gotten a good look at the analytics or telemetry or whatever that, that comes out of some games. I would, I would love to see if you are a game developer and you have access to screenshots of what your, what your stuff looks like, feel free to send it to podcast at guard dot bike. If you, I will keep it anonymous and not publish it anywhere. If you just, I just, I'm just curious to see it. Send me some my way. I'm, I just want to look at that stuff. That's going to do it for the show. 
Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out and uh, going with me on this roller coaster ride. This uh, I'm not going to drink the other. I, mm, I have not determined what to do with the other half of this bottle. I don't know what to do. I'm tempted to just throw it all away. It's, uh, it's scary. And I think it's, I'm excited. I'm excited that there's still a beverage on the market. This isn't a beverage. This is a supplement. This is a, this is a fucking, this is medicine. This is medicine. I need my medicine. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's exciting that there's still a product on the shelves that fucking scares the shit out of me. I don't want any more of this. This would not make me better at video games. This is not like a fucking improves body and mind or response times. This is not fucking gamer fuel. This is fucking liquid crank. This is fucking white. This is, we've got to get this motorcycle to New Mexico by nightfall. Don't ask me any more questions. We are all going to end up getting killed. Just get on the bike and ride. Um, bad stuff. Bad stuff. Not like, give me a little boost so I can get through the day. This is like, I mean, I, yeah, I get, you know. Now that I, I mean, I have three and a half bottles of this. Maybe I should get, you know, get into lifting weights. Build my own sweat lodge. Um, anyway, have a good one. Be back next week with another show. Uh, tomorrow, we will take a look at AEW Fight Forever uh, on stream. And uh, then we'll be back Friday and do some other stuff and all some other AEW stuff going up on the YouTube channel. Like I said, Glenn Rubenstein and I, Glenn is on a wrestling podcast uh, in some other part when he's when he's not doing Las Vegas stuff. Um, he's on a wrestling podcast. So we ended up talking about wrestling. He managed to, he tried to sell me on watching NXT. Uh, but we talked about, you know, we talked a little bit about Forbidden Door 2 and some of the other stuff that's been been going on. We didn't get too deep into Forbidden Door 2. So instead I'll say here, I thought that was a heck of a show. That's all. I don't know. I I enjoyed it. I thought it was a. Uh, I thought it was fun. I enjoyed watching it a great deal, much like most AEW stuff. I thought it was a very fun show. Um. Anyway, I'm gonna get going. Have a good one. Be back tomorrow. Bye.